Good evening. I want to welcome everybody to the Human Relations Commission regular meeting, August 12, 2021. I want to welcome all staff, um, council members, and commissioners back from our summer break. I hope you all are rested. Um, we have a full docket this evening. I would like staff to do the roll call to begin our meeting. Commissioner Everly, you have to speak. Muted, sorry. Here. Commissioner Krause. Here. Commissioner Regeer. Here. Commissioner Savage. Here. Chair Smith. Here. Council Member Stone. Here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any agenda changes, requests, or deletions? We do not. Okay. Do we have any oral communications? If a topic is already on the agenda, it doesn't need, it cannot be addressed during this time. If there's a topic that is not on the agenda, we would ask that you speak about it now. Um, I see one name, Chair. Yes, my good friend, um, um, Mr. James, you have two minutes, sir. Go ahead, please. Aram, go ahead, please. He's still muted. You're still muted. Okay, there we go. So there you go. Good evening to everybody. Um, and uh, so tonight I wanted to discuss a couple of things briefly. One, uh, I've sent you a message regarding the importance of the upcoming district attorney's race. The uh, first vote in the race will be at the primary of, in June 7th of 2022. And I've sent you some notes I have that I think are important about the race, but also the interview that Dave Price mm -hmm. just conducted of the, the, the candidate that's running against the incumbent, Sajid Khan, who's been with the Public Defender's Office for 13 years. I'm hopeful that you'll invite both candidates to the Human Relations Commission to debate the critical issues of the day. Secondly, um, I just learned of a book. Um, somebody's reached out to me, actually the author of the book, because uh, it's a study of the Boston criminal courts published in 2020. And the title of the book is How Race and Class Matter in Criminal Court. It's uh, done and prevalent, I should say, Publish and Punishment, How Race and Class Matter in the Criminal Court by Matthew Clare, who's a professor of sociology in a, at Stanford and also a professor, guest professor at the law school uh, guest lecturer. I'm not sure what exactly that status is, but he's contacted me through some folks. He did an exhaustive study of the issue that I just mentioned in the Boston courts and now is embarking on a similar study of Santa Clara County. Wow. It's an intense academic book of Boston. I've gotten through about the first 40 of the 150 page book or so. And then there's another 50 pages of uh, academic citations. I'm hopeful, certainly, that uh, our new member, one of our two new members, the defense counsel from the private uh, private bar, will read that book. And I know, I know, Greer Stone is a is a uh, an attorney, but I think all of you should read the book, and we should invite the author. What an opportunity! I can't speak for him as to whether or not he would come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. James. Um, there are you. no more names, Chair. Thank you so much for bringing that up, um, Mr. James. Um, Matthew Clare is familiar to this entire commission. He has actually presented here before. Um, so, and I've communicated with him outside of this. So as we go through this, um, is the, if it's the right opportunity, we'll definitely bring him back. All right, has everybody, um, has everybody reviewed the minutes um, as sent to us? I would like to, I'd like somebody on the floor to make a motion to approve the minutes if there are no changes. I move to approve. Can I have a second? I'll second it. Second. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Everly. Thank you, Commissioner Savage. We will do a vote. I will start um, from the top of the alphabet and work my way back. We will start with uh, Commissioner Everly. Aye. Commissioner Krause? Aye. Commissioner Regeer? Aye. Commissioner Savage? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Thank you so much. The minutes have passed. At this time, I think um, 
we have an extremely weighty topic on, in front of us. Um, our first piece of business is to review and prioritization of pro, pro citywide renter protection. We'll have Claire Campbell, manager of long range planning and Lauren Bigelow, partnership for the Bay's Future Fellow at City of Palo Alto. The way we will do this will allow them to present. I will give each commissioner two minutes to ask the first round of questions. After that, I will open up for public comment. Staff, um, just make sure I don't go three rounds of questions before I open for public comment. And then after that, we will see where we stand. We might have to open it up again for another round of questions. Um, but what I've, after, I pray everybody has read this exhaustive report. Um, it is really well written. I don't agree with everything in it, but I will give them credit. It is really well written and has some good, some good data points in it. If you are watching, you can go to the city page and click on our agenda to download the report because I think it will help ground the conversation. And I think it becomes critical for us to stay on task if we really stick with the nine recommendations. Um, so Claire and Laura, it's your show. All right, thank you so much. So good evening, Chair Smith and commissioners. Um, as you said, my name is Claire Campbell and I'm the manager of Long Range Planning. And I'm here tonight with Lauren Bigelow, who's our Challenge Grant Fellow. And she's been working hard with us to do research and developing um, for developing our renter protection policies uh, for the city. So we came to the HRC this past February to get your initial thoughts and feedback on policies and outreach. And we're back here tonight to continue that conversation and ask the HRC to take formal action to make some recommendations to council for consideration. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it over to Lauren and we can get started with our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Claire. I appreciate it. Um, and let me get this presentation all set up for you and we'll be raring to go. Okay. Ooh. There we go. Everybody can see the recommendations for renter protection policies. Great. Okay, so good evening, commissioners, and thank you so much for the opportunity to revisit our discussion about renters in Palo Alto. It's lovely to see folks again. If you recall, my name is Lauren Bigelow, and I am the partnership for the Bay's Future Fellow, placed with the city of Palo Alto to work on renter protections. To give a large overview and really talk about the purpose of why we're here again. It's to talk about the research and the conversations that we've had and how those brought us to our current policy recommendations. We're here tonight to go over nine policies. We analyzed and get your recommendations on what order each policy should be pursued in, if at all. To center the conversation on the folks most directly impacted, I'll talk briefly about some of the demographic data regarding our renters and housing stock, as well as touch on the current laws. So for the past three and a half years, renter protections have been a council identified concern with council directing staff to pay particular attention to relocation assistance, evictions without a just cause, and large rent increases while balancing those protections uh, with protecting the rights of the property owners. The policy development process began in March 2020, and we're hoping to bring your recommendations to City Council Fall 2021 with further ordinance development occurring in late Fall 2021 and revisiting the PTC and Council again with proposed ordinances at the beginning of winter 2022. You can't talk about renter protection policy without talking about renters though. So here's some really quick data points. 
our renters and what's most important to know about them, I think is a misconception that a lot of folks have about Palo Alto. Actually 45% of the occupied housing units in Palo Alto or 11,764 units, if you wanna get specific, are renter occupied. And of those households, 27% of those households are renting single family homes. 35% of those households are at either small or medium sized properties between five and 49 units. And 22% of those households are at large apartment complexes with 50 or more units on site. And if you reference the staff report, you'll see that 39% of the households are making more than $150,000 a year collectively, while 27% are making less than $50,000 a year. And here we can see that breakdown just a little bit more detail of note is that the percentage of those renters in each income tier that are cost burdened uh, is that last column there. And when I say cost burdened, what I mean is they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. You'll notice that starting at $75,000 or less, or rather the orange portion here, 70% or more of those households are experiencing cost burdens to live here in Palo Alto. So those are our renters. And as I mentioned last time, Palo Alto does have some existing protections like a mandatory mediation program and one year leases are required to be offered to tenants. Tenant relocation assistance also applies, as I mentioned before, to 22% of the rental housing stock or properties with 50 or more units on site. And the existing renter protections that deal with COVID-19 response are a whole slew of overlaying policies from local to national that are frequently in flux. Uh, suffice it to say that we are currently following state moratoria and um, I'm not gonna focus a whole lot on those. The one renter protection, bill from the state that I'll briefly touch on is AB 1482. And AB 1482 is important because it has a rent cap built into it and just cause framework, which outlines what some fair reasons are for a person to be evicted from their home. A couple of things to take note of here is that this law doesn't unfortunately call, cover all of our renters and that while this law does apply across the state, it does not give funds or framework for implementation. I'll talk more about this when we get into the proposed protections though. So that's who our renters are rapid fire and what protections apply to them. And this brings us to the meat of our discussion, which are the proposed potential rental protection policies. So we analyzed nine policies, seven of which we think that the city should pursue. And we've ranked them here in order of feasibility. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is how difficult and or costly to the city it would be to implement them and who it would impact. It's my hope that the order that the city chooses to pursue these policies are the main topic of conversation tonight. Our questions are, which do we have to take action on right now immediately and which seem less feasible or impactful. Um, and as we mentioned in our report, we did go to the Planning and Transportation Commission or the PTC for some direction in April and their recommendations are folded into both the presentation and staff report. Okay, as we know, Staff works really hard to uh, accomplish what city council tasks them with and any new policies or programs would require more resources or at the very least a reallocation of resources. 
There are a considerable number of opportunities here, but they should be phased in over time as they all require more research and outreach to help shape development. There are three ways that implementation could go based on how actively the city wants to be involved with implementation and enforcement. Not all policies may be, may be pursued the same way and how each policy is implemented will change the cost and timeline for bringing ordinances forward. The options are listed here under a variety of strategies. So active implementation and enforcement, um, that's like when a city funds consultants to really proactively administer the programs and ensure compliance. Active education and private enforcement is when the city does the work with the ordinance but leaves the enforcement side to private pursuit uh, violations. And the last um, is certainly the heaviest list, lift, which is building resources to support active implementation and enforcement, which is collecting a whole bunch of different resources, um, pulling them together, letting folks know uh, what resources are available to them and actively pursuing both implementation and enforcement. Um, so, that is phasing and enforcement. And just to break down really quickly, uh, the analysis template that we looked at, um, we thought several things were important to cover when analyzing these policies. So they should all follow the same format. So there'll be a description of the policy and whether there are ties to any local or state laws, who the policy impacts, uh, is touched on and what costs might look like are mentioned as well, though I'll also mention that costs are thoughts on costs are very preliminary at this point and are subject to change again depending on how the city decides to move forward with implementation and enforcement, if at all. How feasible it would be to implement is mentioned and is also subject to change based on those same things. Obstacles or support for implementation are mentioned here. And lastly, we end on the PTC recommendation. So number one, we start with the rental survey program. And that's really a method of collecting data and forecasting trends regarding renters or landlords. Um, this program has been outlined in the municipal code since 2002, but we are not actively enforcing it. Having this program in place would allow for better enforcement of 1482, as we could see whether rent increase increases were within that rent cap as well as collecting other data that would help inform the development of other renter protection policies like when eviction notices are served and what occurs after that or how long units are vacant. So this program, uh, we think the impact is high. It would impact all Palo Alto renters and its cost could potentially be covered by a small per unit fee uh, for point of reference. Los Angeles fees are less than $20 per unit to fund their rent registry program and Mountain Views program started charging $115 a year to fund the staff of four people running their program which encompasses a whole bunch of other rent stabilization efforts. So we have an entire spectrum to work with there. As the program and fee are already within the code and it's supported by our renters, our team believes that the feasibility is high. And the PTC does recommend that the council consider this the highest priority, though the, they did advise that this survey cost should be covered by the city. Um, and are hopeful that we can work in conjunction with them while developing this program. Second in our lineup is another policy that's part of the municipal code already, which is tenant relocation assistance, which is a, as it says, a flat fee taken on by the landlord to assist a tenant who is being displaced. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, this currently only applies to 22% 20 of the rental units in Palo Alto, which are between uh, properties 
with 50 units or more, so big, big properties. Um, and it has been part of the municipal code since 2018, um, a point in time when our community was really interested in anti-displacement work due to all of the conversations surrounding the President Hotel. And uh, tenant relocation has the potential for highly impacting uh, renters within a specific category, uh, which is those at risk of displacement, particularly those who are at small to medium sized property. And the feasibility of this property, of this policy really hinges on the fact that while this is not a super huge lift energetically for staff. It is uh, an additional ask on developers, and that is something to be aware of while we are attempting to meet regional housing needs and develop our housing element. The PTC recommended unanimously that the relocation assistance requirement uh, should not be expanded to apply based on property size. Initially, we talked about um, lowering the threshold to a unit size, but based on a non-income based metric to serve cost burden households. And a couple of ways we thought about that were in attachment A in the staff report, which are really um, either having people prove their uh, participation in other income based programs or uh, working with what is considered an affordable rent based on household size and saying more or less about that later in development. Okay, next up we have the eviction reduction program. And because eviction is one of the greatest causes of homelessness, it might it makes a lot of sense for us to try and, and stem that tide. One of the ways in which people do that is through creating a framework for what con constitutes a fair eviction or a just cause. Just cause eviction protections are written into AB 1482, but again, it doesn't cover everybody um, and it's not permanent. So while having these protections for some people for 10 years is a great start, uh, we can do better. So it does not cover rental units and properties built within the last 15 years, rental units occupied by renters for less than a year, single family homes that are not owned by a corporation or renters who live in a duplex and the other unit is owner occupied. As the eviction reduction program would impact all Palo Alto tenants, we think the impact is high, but this specific fix would provide coverage for those who are not covered by AB 1482, those folks that I just read out, giving them the same rights as all other tenants covered by 1482. And the costs associated would require, again, further research. Um, and it, its feasibility does seem high uh, due to what seems like a, a choice for a legislative patch requiring basically no maintenance or enforcement on the city's part. Um, so the PTC recommended extending the framework for fair evictions to two of those four groups, which were uh, tenants in buildings built within the last 15 years and tenants in units for less than a year who are not currently protected um, by the statewide renter protection law, they did not recommend moving forward with the duplexes or single family home units that were called out before. Our fourth policy is anti rent gouging policy and um, again that's just about providing a patch to AB 1482 so that everybody has access to that same 5% plus consumer price index or CPI amount and are protected by it. Um, the rent cap is supposed to protect folks from massive rent increases, which can force a family out of their home. Again, we think the patch is a high uh, impact, especially for folks who are low income or cost burden renters and 
you've already talked about what those costs and feasibility were like with the last um, with the last policy. However, PTC did not recommend extending these rent increase limits to housing units not protected by the statewide anti-gouging law. So they said none of these four um, should be protected in their estimation. Okay. Fifth, we have security deposit limits. And in California, there is state law that allows landlords to charge two times the rent for an unfurnished unit or three times the rent for a furnished unit with security uh, for a security deposit. Um, but the average rent in Palo Alto is $3,003 a month, which means folks are looking at $9,009 for rent plus security deposit in an unfinished apartment, which is a significant amount of money. Um, so we believe that this will really lower a barrier for access um, for lower income households and those that are particularly cost burdened, though it would impact all renters. Um, so it seems like another high impact, potentially low cost effort and the PTC did recommend that the council consider limiting security deposits to one and a half times the rent, which is slightly less than the California two times the rent. All right, fair chance housing ordinances, basically an anti-discrimination policy that limits landlords from discussing criminal background in the marketing application leasing or vacating of their policy and it's directed at really helping those who've been released from incarceration to help them find stable homes. Um, and this seems like it would be a very impactful policy that we think might have a limited cost due to the fact that this is about criminal background and property owners rights. We think that this could be a little bit more difficult a conversation, um, though it has been passed in several jurisdictions around the Bay. Um, so the PTC did support this and recommend limiting landlords ability to inquire about uh, applicants criminal history. Um, and we're looking for when in the lease up process inquiries would be acceptable. That's what the question we're hoping to bring to Council. Right to counsel is all about providing legal assistance to renters as they go to court for housing related issues. As you can see here, 98% of renters do not have legal representation in these matters. And it really builds off of Palo Alto's existing mediation program. Um, evictions are also uh, the costs associated with displacement and, and disruption to a household. Um, can be really significant for a community. Unfortunately, um, this one is a little bit tricky because the impact is so high, um, but the cost is too. So while we think that a program is an amazing idea, it seems a little cost prohibitive at the moment. Um, there are a couple of things that we can do though. And currently there's a spot bill called AB 1487 that's being heard and it's supposed to help establish funds for right to counsel efforts. Uh, also, uh, Santa Clara County is pursuing the creation of a housing court um, where they pair tenants with an advocate to help with their case. So the PTC did recommend that the city endorse the concept of right to counsel, um, advocating to the county, to the courts and the supervisors that an eviction court be established and support legislative efforts to fund right to counsel. Okay, last couple guys, we're almost there. <laughs> um, the Tenant or Community Opportunity to Purchase Act is really about providing renters with advance notice when the landlord is selling as a way to organize um, a purchase. And 
it really is supposed to help folks who are at risk at risk of displacement um, due to sold units. Um, the cost would be minimal to the city, but it would require a code amendment and um, due to the cost of housing uh, purchasing units in the city of Palo Alto, it would be a really heavy lift for tenants. So the feasibility seems kind of low. Um, the PTC does recommend that the city not move forward with the policy at this time, but they did vote to request council to direct staff to pursue other means um, for displacement at the time of property sale. And last but not least, uh, we have proactive rental inspection, which we did not recommend, which is about keeping the housing stock safe and up to code by having code inspectors routinely inspect all rental units in Palo Alto. Um, and it would impact any renter in substandard housing. The cost could be pretty significant um, because of the staffing requirements for sending out um, code inspectors to see all of the rental housing in Palo Alto on an annual or semi-annual basis. So the feasibility seems pretty low. The PTC unanimously recommended that the city not move forward with the policy at this time. This is just a whole lot of much shorter ways to say the things that I was saying, where we call out the descriptions, the impact to tenants and the next steps to enact. Um, kind of a briefer way for you guys to see in one slide that the first three recommended policies and the second three recommended policies. And then our last three where we don't recommend direct pursuit of these um, or at all. So what we're hoping for tonight is to review the nine renter protection policies and provide feedback regarding for uh, support for each one and ranking the policy recommendations in order of priority. Our plan is to take the PTC and your recommendations to the council tentatively scheduled for October 4th um, and return to the PTC with ordinance language in late fall, early winter 2021. And please, 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 if you have any thoughts that you aren't comfortable with sharing at this moment, um, please feel free to email me. My email address is located here and I would love to talk to folks about this. Thank you so much for your time and I'll stop sharing now. And deep breath, <laughs> we did it. One phenomenal presentation, one procedural question for you, Laura. If we can't come up with a concise list of um, recommendations, can we have till September or do we need to hash it all out tonight? That is a great question. And I will, because Claire has been at the city longer than I have, I will toss it to her and, and see what her recommendation is. Um, Cause I feel like she has a better idea of the process regarding these things. Yes. So uh, what we could do, if we can't get through all of the items, as far as taking action, we could continue the discussion to the next meeting if we can't get through all of it tonight. But certainly maybe we can do it in chunks if we if it looks like we're not going to get through it all, maybe we can get through the first half or however it works out tonight. And then we can continue to the next meeting. Um, so that is definitely an option if we need to do that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, I think it's important for um, each commissioner to sort of get their initial thoughts out so they'll ask their round robin questions. Um, we'll open up to public comment. And then I think the next grouping will be items one through three. And then we can sort of work our way through that. Does everybody agree with that? So cool. Okay, cool. All right, um, we'll, we'll go alphabetically, Commissioner Evan. Um, Chair, may I just interject? Did you want to do two minutes? Because then Mary will be timing and then she will come on screen when yeah. the. Yes, sir. We want to do two minutes because okay. there's okay. a lot to cover here. And Thank I'm you. giving commissioners the same as I give public. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation and the report. Uh, it was great. I So 
are, let me just get this clear that I'm just talking about general comments right now, mm -hmm. and then we'll go one by one later. Um, well, I can say that the first issue that I have is that it's going to be really hard to prioritize without number one being done. So that jumps out to me right from the get go without the rental survey. I'm going to have a hard time prioritizing the other, you know, eight. <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure how other people feel about it, but that's, um, one of the main takeaways. So I can tell you right now that I do believe that that should be the number one priority, the rental survey, so that we know where we're going from there. And then the other thing is that some of them seem to be, to relate to the president hotel. It, I mean... I don't know how to put it, but basically everything that happened back then. And I'm not so sure that it applies to too many buildings in Palo Alto. Mm. So I am going to have some questions uh, later on as we go through them. Specifically, you know, what are we talking about here? I mean, even the fair chance ordinance, are people real? Are people being denied rental housing based on their backgrounds? I mean, do we have any idea if that's happening and at where in the process is it happening? Um, so um, I do believe that number one, you know, is going to help us be able to prioritize, but uh, it looks like we might not have that luxury. So well, we'll, we'll see what everybody else has to say. That's all for now. Thank you. Commissioner Krauss. Hello. This is something really exciting, Lauren, that you've done, because we've waited a really long time in Palo Alto to bring this to the table. I lived the President Hotel experience, and I can tell you, and spearheaded, and chose the lawyer, and helped us develop the right strategy. I can tell you two and three are essential. There's no discussion. You have to handle just cause eviction. Mm -hmm. That's on the table. No civilized city would deny that opportunity. How do I really feel? But I think that those are the issues that the rental population will find most important to them. The relocation packages enable them to move on regardless of their income. When they have to move, even if you make over 100,000 in Silicon Valley, it's still a difficult reach because that's a lot of money in other parts of the country. It's not here. So the one, two, and three are essential. And I'd like to recommend that we make them a priority. Mm -hmm. Four, five, and six, there's a lot to discuss. One of my pet peeves is your last, which is the inspection. You have no idea what's being presented as living uh, situations. Minutes. I'm done. Thank you, but Tom. we need to do that and consider it long term. Okay. Um, Commissioner Regan. All right. I, this is great, this presentation. And Thank you so much. Um, so I apologize if I, I can't remember the slides. I tried taking some pictures, so I apologize if I'm asking a question that you already presented. But I guess um, I'm wondering if, if other cities have done some kind of surveys and, and do you know what they have shown when they get the results and how it, per how it pertains to protection, you know, like the data and how it relates to protections of renters? Do you know any other cities that have done something like this? And I guess, can you answer or, or do we? You can go. 
Right, Lauren, you can answer. Perfect. Um, I actually, that was going to be my question if I could answer. Uh, but I, there, if you pull up the staff report, there's a whole big spreadsheet that goes through all of the individual tenant protections that we recommend, as well as regional city. There it is. No. Yep. Uh, that talks about which cities have them and which don't. Um, and they're fairly comparable cities in our region. So not only is there an overview of mm -hmm. the entire package, but there are also many um, tables, which I have, if you want to look at them for each policy as well, um, I can throw those slides up on the screen when we address them directly. Okay, that's what I was, and then the other one is, do you know, because I know I was looking at the slides, do you know what the housing types of the lowest income residents are in Palo Alto? That is such a difficult question to answer and I, I desperately want to know. Um, but I, I think that Commissioner Everly really pointed out that it's gonna be really difficult to do without the rental survey program fully implemented. Um, right. from, from experience, I can say that um, anecdotally, when I was working with the affordable housing community um, in Palo Alto for the past mm -hmm. four years, um, at Alta Housing, a lot of folks rented rooms <gasps> In, in larger units. And so they split space with families. That's what is I that was... my time, Mary? <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. Commissioner Savage. Um, yeah, um, well, first of all, I, I pretty much agree with the recommendations uh, by the PTC, but um, and I also agree that number one has to be addressed before we can really go further. But I, I put a star in front of numbers one, three, and five. I, I looked at those uh, as the highest priority in my book. And um, further down, number seven, you know, we have an excellent mediation program. So there should be, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know right to counsel just doesn't exist for me uh, because of our mediation program. And um, that's, that's my thoughts for now. All right. Um... Lauren, um, thank you. Great report. Um, as I was going through the data, I go to it. Um, I have just some fundamental concerns about some of the demographic data, um, particularly 75,000 being the cutoff point because attachment A in your report indicates that you need to make $141,600 is the AMI in our area and it's almost $4,000 a month in rent. So that basically is saying to me that if you make 150,000, you have basic, you're basically paying 50,000 in rent, which I think if we could stretch that out, and I think the rental survey is gonna become very critical because um, one of the things in my notes I've noticed is that um, young families, particularly when they get to a second child, the leap is so high to their own house or the leap is so high to a second bedroom or third bedroom place that it's time to go. The, um, really quickly, I think rental surveys would go. I do not like tenant relocation um, because I believe burdening people to develop in the city for future units. Um, we already have, you know, Palo Alto is a city of fees. I mean, they charge you for oxygen and water and air. So, you know, charging to build more units, I think is a challenge. Just cause rent control, um, 1482 patch and fair chance of security deposit seem to be right along. Uh, I agree with um, Commissioner um, Savage that if I had to leave one on the table, right to counsel might be it. But I also understand because of the mediation program, but I also understand it's a very the power dynamic shifts from the landlord in a mediation situation because they hold the cards to a tenant once they have to go to a court and the tenant has um, legal defense. Thank you. So now we are going to open up for community. Um, I will start with, um, let's see, well, everybody has two minutes. I'll start with Angie Evans, Angela Evans, I'm sorry, and we can work our way down staff. 
If you could just wait till Mary gets the timer on the screen chair, and then I will, I will, um, I will go through the list. There we go. So Angie, you have um, two minutes. Go ahead, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am Angie Evans. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Palo Alto Renters Association. I am one of the um, steering committee members for the Renters Association. A little bit about us, last year, the Palo Alto Renters Association formed um, after years of all of us watching longtime renters being really underrepresented on commissions, boards, and council. We believe that policy solutions must come from those most impacted by systemic problems. That is why our is in Palo Alto. You can read more about us at um, Palo Alto Renters, uh, paloaltorenters.org. Um, okay, so thank you for talking about renter protections. Because of our median home prices, home ownership is out of reach for so many Palo Altans, um, half of Palo Alto rents. Similarly, 60% of East Palo Alto rents, but because they have rent control, the cost of living is a little more in line with the resident incomes. In the last five years, rent controlled homes have seen 4% increases in rents, while um, non rent control homes had 55 to 60% rent increases. The Renters Association can tell you what the greatest number of displaced renters um, that, that, that they're all living in single family homes, the folks who are recently displaced. We can tell you that it's often single mothers of color. Um, we can share all these data points, but you and I know that we won't be heard when we share them. So I hope that this body will help us push for a fully implemented rent registry in Palo Alto so that we can understand what we need as a community. Um, I also worked on tenant relocation assistance through San Mateo County and managed a Stanford fellow studying their efficacy. So I'm happy to talk to any of you about tenant relocation assistance off the meeting. Um, we're not saying not to pass any of the other measures, but we really are pushing for a rent registry because I think it, as many of you have said, it will fold into the best policymaking for our jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. The next speaker is Emily Ramos. Emily, go ahead, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Wonderful. Um, good evening, Chair Smith and Commissioners. This is Emily Ann Ramos with Silicon Valley at Home, and we value the partnership we have with the city on this goal of protecting tenants. We are happy with the direction this project is going, and we hope that the HRC supports all the policies presented and recommended tonight by staff. We hope that you prioritize by the order presented. Thank you for your time and input on this essential set of tenant protections and we're happy to address any questions or concerns you have about any of the policies that are being presented tonight or more policies after that. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Emily. The next speaker is Anil um, Babar. Uh, Anil, you have two minutes. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, please. Great, sorry, I just want to make sure. Hi, my name is Anil Babar. I'm calling here on behalf of the California Apartment Association, voicing our concern with the policies presented forward. Um, you know, as this pandemic has shown, many of the mom and pop landlords have suffered greatly during this time. Uh, operating, they've already operated on very small margins, and the pandemic has pushed rents further down, impacting their ability to pay, and and you know, probably spending many years before they're able to dig themselves out of the hole that this pandemic has caused. They still need to maintain their buildings, manage the buildings, pay their mortgage, and keep and and, they, and keep their buildings uh, whole. And you know, many of these policies are going to essentially uh, impact and or hurt their ability to continue doing so. Uh, I should also note that all these policies were not presented to any landlord or organizational landlords themselves for input or advice in advance of when they were being presented. We were only told about this after the fact that after planning committee and uh, transportation committee looked at it. So there wasn't any input being asked of us in ahead of time to see if these are workable policies. And I should also lastly note that the uh, concerns we have with the rent concerns about this information that contains lists of owners and, and tenants with their rent data and their rent and their names and addresses being exposed through a Public Information Act request, a federal state subpoena, or a data breach, which we've seen many times over and over again across the country in various forms. So we want to express our opposition to these uh, policies. And furthermore, 
request that before you go forward recommending any of these policies that you convene a group of landlords, a public setting, so you can hear from them uh, as to all these problems that exist with the policies you're uh, putting forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barbar. Uh, Mr. James, you had your hand up earlier. I don't see it now. Did you want to speak? Yes, okay. You have two minutes, go ahead, please. So first of all, I uh, am a property owner. Uh, recently, I became a full-time, well, not full-time landlord, but inherited properties that my mom purchased and managed for 75 years in Palo Alto. Um, I don't have a bleeding heart for landlords. We write off all sorts of stuff. Sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievably good. Uh, only property in Palo Alto and then as a landlord. And I'd be glad to be on in that posture. I'm also the leasee. I lease a unit in Palo Alto for a member of my family. I'm right now in mediation. I've set that. By the way, it's 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 not mandatory. It's voluntary. Uh, so Ms. Bigelow, I think you might want to correct the record on that. Um, they're asking for a 10% uh, increase after one year there. Um, and uh, to Ms. Savage, uh, uh, Commissioner Savage, Gideon versus Wainwright needs to be expanded to civil matters, including the rights of tenants, because I can tell you, I just spoke with the mediator and I also spoke with Project Sentinel because I'm involved in this mediation. They are so way underfunded right now. They don't have the staff to do the job they want. And certainly council should attach to something as critical as a loss of house housing. There's a big move across the country to extend Gideon versus Wainwright that provided the right to counsel for indigents facing jail time to civil parties. I, I suggest that, hey, I would pay relocation if I'm gonna raise somebody's rent to a position where you know, they can't live there anymore. As a landlord, I think I should, I should. I can write that cost off, okay? Stop whining. Palo Alto landlords, we have it really well. Put me on that commission with those other landlords so I can talk about my mom's experience for 70 years. She was a champion for tenants, uh, even though she Thank was you. a property owner. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more hands. <laughs> um, I would like our council member to speak at this time. Thank you, council member three. Thank you, council member Stone, please. Uh, Thank you, Chair Smith. And I, I appreciate the, the work and the presentation by, by staff and the commission for, for vetting this issue. Um, I, don't, I don't really feel like it's appropriate for me to kind of just weigh in on my, on my thoughts at this time. I, I don't want to bias the conversation. I'm, and I'm really interested to kind of see and hear the commission's debate on this. But you know, I'm a renter myself, and these are issues that I think are, are really important to to our, our city, so I, I'm, I'm glad we're taking up this issue. One thing I would just kind of, uh, not to say caution about, but just try to, a, a, um, I think that's something that'd be great for the HRC is, of course, anything about, um, anything that's viewed as renter protection or, or anything uh, is always very political. And this issue did come, before, and I know there was a colleagues memo that was drafted a couple of years ago by now Mayor Du Bois and I believe Council Member Ku. And there were a lot of groups, right, that uh, I remember I was following it. I was not on council at the time, but many groups that I expected that would support it um, that actually came out uh, against it. And I, I think with these type of issues, uh, I think oftentimes you kind of might feel like it's in the bag and there'll be a lot of support for it. And then all of a sudden you, um, you, you, something comes out of left field uh, and traditional groups might not um, support it. So just keeping that, all that in mind and kind of figuring out how can we address these issues um, to be able to uh, bring some kind of bring people together on both sides for the support would be really helpful. Well, um, th th well first of all, um, I wanted to say thank you to all of the public. I also want to say um, thank you to Angie and the Tenant Coalition, I've watched them work tirelessly in the background. So I'm going to take personal privilege to highlight that. Um, so we'll start, I want to basically frame the discussion. Um, I, I think the question we need to ask Palo Alto is what is our value statement going to be around renters protection? Is it going to be people or property? 
as we start working through this, the question is, is this about people or property? And I believe um, after watch, and this is my opinion, this is not the HRC's opinion, as I continue to watch more and more issues in Palo Alto, the general direction of the question becomes people or property. So um, I want us to work through each one and so that we're organized on this, I'm going to ask for a motion based on each one so that, so that at the end of it, you know, if we only make it to five and we're at like eight o'clock, I can say, okay, let's finish the other items on the agenda and let's come back next month. But I think uh, let's start with number one. I will start with my comments on it. I think um, the data points are going to be um, especially important and the rental survey is critical. I think two parts that, you know, I usually don't believe in the, in the terminal uniqueness that we always say about Palo Alto, but two things are very critical. Um, the expense of renters and how high it reaches up the socioeconomic scale and also the level of um, rental properties that might not be fit, like people living in garages without running water and without heat and, and being charged $2,000 a month because I've heard and seen that story. So I think really having a robust rental survey is going to be super critical to even frame this. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. Commissioner Savage, do you have any thoughts on item one? You're on mute. Yeah, Coloma, I agree with you, everything you said. Um, nothing further to add. Um, I do like your people versus property um, uh, statement. Um, it's a good way of putting it. And, you know, it needs to be balanced. That's difficult to do. But, um, but yeah, those are, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Regan. I, I guess I want to say that as a commission, you did speak for what the Human Relations Commission is. I mean, our mission, I'm just going to read our, our mission is to promote the just and fair treatment of all people in, in Palo Alto, particularly our most vulnerable populations, by promoting awareness of issues and enabling conversations that enhance inclusion. The HRC strives to create a community where civility, respect, and responsible actions are the norm. So I think all of these um, points. I mean, I, I, I think that they all fall under that direction. I don't think we are a political bell. I, I don't think we are a political um, being. We are a commission. So I think we can stick up to our mission and um, we don't have, that's one area that we're clear on. So that's my only point on one, two, three, one through nine is that it seems like they follow all our mission. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Crown. You have to unmute. You have to unmute, Commissioner Krause. You're trying. Uh, Minka, is there any way you can unmute? I can, I can only hit ask to unmute. So um, I, cannot, um, I cannot unmute her if she's muted on her end. There I'm unmuted. Yes. Just my mouth was not behaving. Um, I concur with you, Chair. I think your order and your analytical reasoning on this make good sense. I concur with you, Commissioner Everly, that of the importance of the survey, I think that's an overriding number one. We need to understand what we're working with. Um, and I commend Lauren for the extensive research you've done to date. Um, I think we have to move forward though with a little more haste because these are important issues facing this city and the country right now, as we potentially move out of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Everly. Thank you. I agree with everything that everybody, all the commissioners have said, and you, um, Kaloma, sorry. It's all right. Thank you. <laughs> On the title, yeah, <laughs> Chairman, don't Chairman, don't worry about it. Chairman Smith. Um, I, and as I said before, I do believe that number one, the rental survey is the most important one because it will guide the rest of the protections. I also would like to see if the survey, and I hope it is implemented, that it is done in a way that we actually get to the real data. And by that, I mean what Chairman Smith mentioned, the converted garages, the sublets that are happening, because people might be afraid that they're going to be retaliated against or evicted. So I'm interested when the time comes, I don't know, Lauren, if you are thinking about how you're gonna implement the survey on how are we gonna make sure that when people are answering these questions, they're being truthful and they're not afraid of you know, eviction, deportation, any kind of retaliation. How are we going to assure that, they, that it's gonna be anonymous or you know, nobody's gonna find anything out? So that is my one um, concern about the survey, and I would like to, you know, I just wanted to bring it up to your attention that that is one of the things that I foresee being an obstacle into getting the real data. All right. Um, I will. I will make a motion on the floor that the HRC will support the rental survey as a recommendation to the city council. Um, can I have a second on that motion? I second. second. <laughs> Chair, may I interject um, so that we can more accurately portray the motions? Um, I'm going to ask either that, um, so Mary will be tracking it or Lauren. I do think before we vote that I, I would need it to be on the screen so that everybody could see it because we had some motions at the last meeting that when reread, just were not really um, uh, effective of motion. So I can understand people, there's a lot of them, people like to stay on screen and don't like when something else comes on the screen. But before we vote, I need the motions to come on screen and to be able to see them all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Are we voting on just recommending them or is our goal to prioritize them? I want to, I want to figure Lauren out, can speak to that. I want to figure out what we're going to recommend first. And then we can prioritize what we recommend. Because if we try to do both tasks at the same time, I've been in commissions long enough, we'll be here all night. Because what I, I have things that I, we just have to come to a, a group agreement on what we want to recommend. And then we can start prioritizing. And that could be I think that might be the September discussion, but at least let's figure out what we're recommending to start. Does that make sense? Should so I share my screen now? Yes, yes please, please and thank you, Mary. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, I am moving that the rental survey Sorry, let me start over. I had a great motion before and I forgot it. Okay. Well, it said rental survey. The HRC recommends a weight um, rental survey. It was recommended to city council. Yes. Yeah, I believe that Lauren has provided the language. Is that correct, Lauren? Or does the, um, is that not in your report? So we said what the PTC's recommendation was. Um, okay. And if you guys want to take that on, do your own thing, uh, this is yours to do with as you so choose. I think that we just wanted to make sure that we had both the PTC and the HRC's thoughts on each of these policies. Okay, then I will return it to the chair. We'll make our own motions, thank you. Um, because if we don't make our own motions, then if people want to make friendly amendments or additions, they won't be able to, the, it'll get real squirrely at that point. 
I move that the Human Relations Commission recommends the rental survey to the city council. That is my motion on the floor. Can I have a second, please? I second it. Thank you, Commissioner Regeer. Um, we will start with the vote. We'll start at the bottom of the alphabet this time. Chair Smith, aye. Um, do you, you Chair, um, could you just ask if there are any um, comments before you do so? I, I know it feels like people have commented, but if you just give the opportunity and then you can go to the vote. That is, that is the correct procedure, thank you. Um, do we have any comments? Do we have any unreadinesses? Okay. Yes, Commissioner Krause. Um, I, um, maybe we could modify this to say that the HRC recommends the rental survey um, move forward and be made a priority to the city council. I, I think um, when we do our priority orders, which will be the final motion that we do, when we figure out how we're gonna organize it, we're going to say, we'd like this to be a priority and move and focus on these principles, although we recommend the body of law. Okay. okay. I'm having trouble because you're not asking them to take an action. I can only send it as a recommendation to the city council. All right. Yeah, I can't, we can, the way, the place that we'll be able to, as, as a consultative body, I can't, com I can't like say, I need you to vote on this, particularly the recommendation from the PTC is saying, give us permission to do more research to come up with the right policies, so. What I meant, just <laughs> for clarification, is yeah. if it was the HRC, recommend moving forward with the rental survey to the city council. That would... I will take that as a friendly amendment. Mary, can yeah. we make a modification? Thank you, Commissioner Kraus. That, that mm -hmm. really improves the language. Can you say it for Mary one more time? Um, the H start with, take out, move that, the... And the, and the prior, uh, start with HRC recommends moving forward with the rental survey to the city council. You know, I never get it quite right after I say it. Is that... Oh, is that appropriate? Yeah, that's chair. Sure. That that is appropriate, but you do have to put the move part forward because it is a motion. Okay. Yeah, because we are making a motion on the floor, so you have to actually make. Okay. It. The move is just part of the language. All right, I I like the friendly amendment. Um, is there? Does anybody else have anything else to say on it? Really quickly, was the language that you wanted to move forward with the rental survey as a priority, or were we striking that language? The, prior, the priority is going to be when we figure out the order. Just wanted to make sure I understood. Thank you so much. Yes, there will there will be we we'll, we will put this in, we will take our priorities and put them in an order and put a preamble before it. Does that make sense? All right, I vote yes. Commissioner Savage. Aye. Commissioner Regeer. Aye. Commissioner Krause. Aye. Commissioner Everly. Aye. All right. Um, we will go to the second item, which was the tenant relocation. Um, on this chart, it's different than your presentation. Um, so when you when I'm off kilter from the presentation, let me know. All right. Um, so tenant relocation. I'll start with Commissioner Everly's thoughts on that, and then we can go through the different commissioners and see where we stand. I have a question, um, actually. So right now, it 
only applies to properties that contain 50 or more rental units, correct? And if they're being demolished or significantly remodeled. I understand that's what happened with the President Hotel, but do we have any idea, idea of how many buildings in Palo Alto would this really apply right now? Because I know there's a lot of new buildings that most likely this would never get triggered. So how many buildings does it actually apply to as it stands right now? It's a really great question. Uh, and so it only applies to 22% of the housing stock. And so that's less than a quarter of it. Um, there are a bunch of folks that are in, there are a lot of much smaller properties. But this 22% includes brand new buildings? According to the data, um, the data is a few years old. So it's um, the American Community Survey from 2018 doing a five-year average. And uh, also I would note that um, there hasn't been that much development in Palo Alto over uh, the last decade when it came to um, rental real estate. And so it, it shouldn't have been, those numbers shouldn't have changed that much in the last five years. Would it? But we don't know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Would it help if we showed that slide, the pie chart to just show you that breakdown? Because that really does explain how the breakdown is for all of the rental um, unit types in the city and the percentages. Um, in the deliberation here? Sure, yes, please. Let me get back there. One second. The computer, she is a little, she's a little tired from today. <laughs> okay, so that is the breakdown of the housing stock in its entirety, as you see, that 22% has 50 plus units. Um, and as I mentioned, there are about a third of the units are at small to medium sized properties and about a quarter of them are single family detached homes. Okay. It's just that in your report as well, you said that it was only triggered when the President Hotel got converted, mm -hmm. correct? So yes. So I mean, what I'm trying to get at, I mean, it basically is non-existent. It seems to me this, unless we expand it, it's not actually I happening think. anymore. Um, and I can just clarify that a little bit too. I mean, the whole um, situation surrounding the hotel president conversion and that kind of thing was what triggered this whole conversation and got things started. So I think at that time, you know, that's when staff moved forward, you know, under council direction to try to find a policy that could at least kind of start working towards doing something uh, and establishing something to address this issue. And, you know, there is definitely some recognition, especially when you look at the breakdown of the different unit types within the city that, you know, maybe we should cover other, you know, other units that aren't just these large ones. And the staff report gives some, I think, some great recommendations about, you know, whether you want to include three units or more, five units or more, or 10 units or more. And it really gives you a nice breakdown of how, if you did do that, how much more it covers um, within the city. Um, but these aren't things, so the, the PTC did not make any final recommendations about the individual thresholds for this. Um, they, I think they wanted to leave that to the city council to, to work through. Um, but definitely there is some recognition that we could change this and make it apply and be more effective. Thank you. I'm not, I just want to, you know, clarify. I'm not, I think this is great and I'm happy. Um, oh, for sure. And done. I just want to make sure, like, if we're, that we really do need to expand it in my view otherwise it's not really like at this point helping anybody basically i i guarantee you that if you had these thoughts someone else probably has too so it's good to ask these things and get clarification for the public record more than happy to answer questions um, the other thing that I'll note is that, like I mentioned before, the PTC did recommend that we not move forward with changing the threshold based on unit size, 
but on uh, making sure to work with folks that were cost burdened. Um, so that was a, a switch as well. And so I think that there are probably three things to, to figure out here. Do you recommend this policy? Do you recommend based on unit size or non-income metric? And those are the, I guess, the things that we're trying to figure out. Um, Thank you. Commissioner Krauss. Um, I think those are all important questions. I also think that the spirit of this policy item is one that we should agree upon. That's what is sitting out for debate. If you believe there should be a relocation assistance policy and ability for displaced people as a committee, is the HRC willing to move forward and leave the specificity to the council? I think that's what What's the risk here? Um, let's go to Commissioner Regeer. I agree with what um, I, both commissioners have said. I, um, it's hard on this one because without the register, without the survey, we really don't really know what the displacement part is. I mean, we know because presidents. The hotel was a big thing. I guess that's my concern is that I, I kind of feel like I'm just making saying the spirit is good, like Mr. Kulch was saying, but the details like units. I mean, I, I know people that have been displaced living in the small little, you know, four small houses on one lot that the owner wanted to sell and build a big one. Um, they were very affected because they've been living there for years and years and years. So 50 units, I, I'm, I don't feel like I'd know because of the survey yet. I just know the community a little bit on that one, but um, that's my only comment is I can agree by the spirit of it, but the specifics I um, really can't say until we get the registry to know. Laura, do you have a response? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. And I think you guys are completely correct um, that having the data is necessary to support all of these things. Um, some of the work I did previously, I got to sit next to a bunch of nonprofit developers and hear what they were talking about and things. Um, and I, I try to pay attention to local politics and I'm a Menlo Park Housing Commissioner. So I'm pretty, um, tied into development trends to some degree. Um, and so with this one and the regional housing needs assessment that was done, I think um, we're trying to forecast a little bit rather, it, it's kind of like um, taking a Tylenol before you experience pain. So you're trying to protect against the pain rather than chase after it. Um, so we're trying to take care of something before we see it happening with tenant relocation is the idea that we were working with. Okay. Commissioner Savage. Um, yeah, from the limited amount of information we have on this, it, it makes sense. It's a good idea, even though it just affects a small percentage of renters. Those are my thoughts. All right. Um, I'm glad, Lauren, I brought, I'm glad you brought up the two points you brought up because my current issue is that in talking to developers, the cost of land in Palo Alto is already prohibitive. And the amount of permits, fees, things that we do, it is a 
very expensive area to develop in. The challenge I have is that we won't be able to build, will this be another barrier to building low and mid housing because it adds significantly, particularly to projects that have any level of density. And that is, that is sort of my, my fear is that we this becomes another way to stunt or clip growth because not because we don't have the community will, which is a different discussion, we basically price the developers out with another fee. Yeah, I completely hear you on that one. Um, it is a, a dance trying to balance between those issues and to bring it back to your point, is it about the people or property? Mm -hmm. And uh, so how do we kind of grapple with that issue? Um, it It's a really big deal for a person to uh, lose their home and that becomes a cost to the city. Um, and it is a, a cost to a developer, certainly, if they are trying to, to build more, which would help us meet our housing needs. And, and house more people. Yep. It, it's really tough balance. Um, and I think a lot of developers do a really good job of trying to make sure things pencil before they pursue, um, but I agree that there are a lot of fees to consider when it comes to developing in Palo Alto. Yep. Um, I'm open to a motion. I think, or think I heard uh, Commissioner Klaus present something that could work as a motion. Lauren, would you mind taking the, the slide down? And then Mary could re um, put up the sheet. Thank you. And Lauren, um, could you put up? the recommendation from the PTC? No, because Mary needs to take notes. <laughs> and, oh. But um, there should- Can you, read it? Can you read it to them? Just yeah, so absolutely. Know. That's a great solution. Let me find my screen. One second. All right, so for the uh, PTC's recommendation regarding tenant relocation assistance, they did unanimously recommend that the relocation assistance requirement should not expand to apply based on property size, but based on a non-income based metric to serve cost burdened households. Say that one more time. You said non-income, but then cost burden. How does that match? It's, it's um, something that we tried to explore a little bit because it is a tricky thing um, since cost burdening is basically about how much of your income you're spending on your housing costs. Uh, so oh, I see what you're saying. According in, to your AMI, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically you're saying you're not disqualifying somebody because they made $200,000. It's based on the burden of their income. Right, uh, ish. It's so initially when we went to the PTC, we said, hey, we want to figure out if we want to lower this threshold to three, five, or 10 um, plus units at a property mm -hmm. so we could stair step and see and, and help more folks. Um, but they said, you know, let's shift this. It's not about how big or small a property is, whether it's mom and pop or um, big corporate landlords, it's more about the renters themselves and what they're experiencing. So um, it, in attachment A in the staff report, it listed a couple of uh, scenarios in which we could kind of explore non-income based metric. It is tricky. Um, and so some of the recommendations were to either incorporate um, proof of participation in another income-based program like SNAP um, or okay. to um, base it off of 
anyone paying a rent of whatever the affordable rent is for that household size or less gets assistance and those who pay more than that rent um, and are not cost burdened do, uh, which is, like I said, it's, it's kind of tricky to parse. And I think we can apologize too. I think when we wrote the motion out, it's probably, it's a little, we could have said it a little bit plainer too. So I think the PTC did support the expansion of tenant relocation assistance, but they had some caveats in there, like trying to explore other ways to, to run that calculation, yeah. So may I suggest we move to support the expansion of the tenant relocation assistance based upon the income metrics and the burden to the tenants. Metrics is M-E-T-R-I-C-S. The, the X is beside the C on the keyboard, so it's a small typo. Um, let's, do we have a second? I didn't get it all either. Move to support the expansion relocation. Tenant relocation, Mary. Expansion of the tenant relocation. Yeah, I, I have a problem with the burden to the tenants. Um, who, who determines that? That's kind of a nebulous phrase. Uh, what I was inferring, and please correct me, I was using the metric, the reason I use the word metrics, it's the AMI standards by which household income is uh, supported with the burden of how much the percentage that is spent on rent. I think the burden, the burden ratio is 30%, if I'm correct. That is correct. That's and so correct. in, as I understand it, Commissioner Kraus, you're saying that you do want to base this expansion on income uh, and the cost burden and the AMI Correctly. burden. Yeah. Okay. And please. AMI burden? Yeah, word this correctly. Please. Okay. Mary, I want to make I want to make a friendly amendment if um please. Commissioner Clark will allow it. Um it's only it's only one word before the word burden. I want to put the the term AMI. And yeah, that's it. Yes. Because that covers 30, that will give us that 30% threshold, which is a standardized threshold. Is that correct, Lori? I, I'm sorry. I thought Commissioner Kraus added the word cost to before the word burden. Does she not? At this point, I'm not sure because I spoke it, and it could be the cost burden that would clarify it further the cost burden is that 30 percent and ami burden is just talking about the area median income burden um well so so but they're not the same thing is that correct that is correct they are not the same thing so um commissioner Krauss, which one would you like and so i'll make the friendly amendment should it be cost burden yeah let's do it that way Mary, then, then it's clear. My friendly amendment will be cost burden, and we can go from there. All right. Um, do we have a, a second on the motion, please? I will second it. Oh. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we will we will start at the top of the um, of the uh, alphabet, Commissioner. Sorry, right, Chair. Um, discussion or at this point? I thought that was just a discussion. Okay, if, if, if the commission, yeah, usually it's 
after the amend uh, the the motion. But if the commission feels comfortable, that is fine. I just wanted to ensure. Are there any other discussion points before we move ahead? Well, I think it's comments, right? Now we go to comments mm -hmm. and then vote. Am I wrong? Yeah. So sometimes um, people, when you say vote, they'll say they have an unreadiness. So if anybody has an unreadiness at this point, they can say whatever and they can make their comment. Well, if someone has a um, has a, a motion, you can still have you know comments or questions about their their motion before it, you know he goes towards the vote. Um, Commissioner Regeer, you were saying something? Yeah, I'm just trying to visualize the impact that it's going, like back to Commissioner um, Errol's um, point about how many people is this going to affect. And I, I'm just, it's its very hard to, um, I mean, are we saying that somebody that's a landlord that's been lowering, like keeping it within that, and then they die and then the family can't support, you know, they, they've owned it and they have to sell it because they just can't afford a property. I mean, it's like, but yet it's still within their means. Does that mean that they don't have to pay this this location? But then if someone's renting a house for twenty five thousand dollars and they make, you know, that would be like how much would that be? Thirty percent would be, let's say, um, seventy five, around eight thousand dollars. Yeah, or but they. Their rent is twenty five thousand dollars a month. That's what I'm saying. Is I mean, we yeah. have people that are paying twenty five thousand dollars a month, and, and if they were might... making seventy five thousand dollars a month, that would yeah. be an affordable rent for them. Right, right. I'm just trying to visualize. I would trade for that. I, would, I really would. I would trade for that. <laughs> um, I, I'm just. I'm just trying to visualize this whole the impact of people on on. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, uh, Commissioner Gear. Like, I get the conceptual framework, but I have too many question marks that I feel like um, I wouldn't vote against it, but I, I would have to abstain because I don't have enough information. May um, I suggest an amendment? It's your, it's your motion. You can make whatever amendment. Well, if we move to support the expansion of the tenant relocation uh, policy, and we do not specify the number of units so that Commissioner Regular, we could indeed go down to the four unit property as well as the above 50. I was attempting to expand that to satisfy that and then trying to make it income based. If to expand the pool that might have some coverage beyond the 22% of the greater than 50. So I would be willing to move to support the expansion of the tenant relocation policy and period, uh, leaving the, spe the specifications of income versus property size in terms of units to the more lengthy deliberation of the Palo Alto City Council. Um, we have a modification on the motion. Um, Commissioner Everly, do you want to continue to hold your second on this? Oh, I'm open to a modification, yes. No, I'm, I need your second to back you on it. Oh. Were you talking to me? I'm sorry, somebody else answered. Yes, no, no, you have to answer this procedurally. Yes, I... You second it? Yes, I'll second it. That's fine, I'm okay with that. All right, do we have any other discussion, please? All right, I have one more. I, I, I'm wondering, um, 
if we could, this is Patty, I'm, I'm wondering, because our first priority is the register. We've all said that we want to know what we're dealing with with the survey. And is there a way, which was asked, which was my first question when I, when I asked at the beginning, what are we going to do with the, the data that we did for protection? And it seems like we're, we're trying to make the protections now without knowing really what we're protecting because we haven't done the survey. So, do you know what I'm saying? Can I present a compromise? So, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out a compromise. So, can we put in there so, because this is based on, you know, that we're going to revisit it after we've gotten the survey? Because. So, so I think before we even get to the priority list, everybody is, is leaning that the rental survey is critical. I would like to. Um, more lengthy, I would like to make a friendly um, amendment that says, so as terms units to more lengthy deliberations of the Palo Alto City Council after rental survey. Right, I, that'd be, I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at. It's like. Um, because I think that, that, this is this one, and I think um, Councilmember Group Stone said it perfectly. It's going to be a very charged topic, and and I think you'll get a lot of anecdotal information until you have the rental survey. So, and when we go through our priority list, we have to make sure the rent rental survey is at the top of the list, so that if there is this piece, we can say we can start, there'll be more data to answer. Does that make sense, uh, Lauren? And can I just clear? jump in here too? Um, so I, I'm really hearing everyone's comments and, and some of the concerns that you're raising, but when we're looking at the prioritization, we don't necessarily have to think of them as being like consecutive. I mean, we do think initially when we're talking about some of these ideas is that maybe we would focus on the the top three and get them all moving and rolling and you know working on implementation and things like that. So um, they don't necessarily have to be exclusive. Like one has to get done first and, and to start moving on a different one of the, uh, you know, on a different policy. Um, in some ways I do see the expansion of the tenant relocation assistance. It's, it can be seen as an independent policy that we, we if we think that they're we should be covering more t more units in the city. We can move forward with that, even without having the rental survey information. I mean, that could be something that we recognize as it makes sense for the city and we could move that forward. Um, but these are just some ideas I just wanted to throw out there. So, you know, we're hoping- So, so what I will do for okay. you, Claire, is I will strike my friendly amendment. And, and we have a second because that, from to, 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 to hear your comments, you don't want to hitch the train on this based on the rental survey. Is that what you're saying to us? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I'm comfortable with it. Um, Can I get some clarity um, where we are now? Is it the- We're at, we're at, we're Can at, Mary possibly highlight the one that is under consideration Krauss. now? We're at Kraus. That okay. one we'll move to support. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Or you can erase, you can erase a friendly amendment, Mary, the one okay. in red, that we don't need it for the record, because I withdrew it. Okay, we have a second. We have a vote. Um, Commissioner, do we have any other comments? I just want to say, I, I totally agree, because I take back what I was saying, because I think we as a city need to do what's best, whether or not we know, and, and I mean by best is what for the rent, in my opinion, the vulnerable, and it's, it is the renters. So okay. I would be afraid of waiting and waiting, waiting for anything to protect renters because of the survey. That is, that is, that is fair commentary. All right, um, Commissioner, I believe your vote. Aye. Commissioner Krause. Hey. Commissioner Regan. Aye. Commissioner Savage. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. 
All right. I just want to say two two quick things. Um, I really want to get through just cause rent control tonight and maybe 1482 cash. I'm going to try to get it done by eight o'clock because um, I know some of the other items we have. We have two other items that are going to take 30 minutes each. So we're cruising towards the 10 o'clock close time. So I want us to um, really crank in on the next two. Um, just for clarity's sake, um, you can take that down, um, Mary. I'm gonna ask Lauren to read the motion on the just cause that they have from the PTC to begin our discussion. Then I'll ask each commissioner to comment in and then we'll see if we can get a, um, a vote on it. Again, trying to get as much done by eight o'clock as possible. Does that make everybody feel all right with that? Thank you, Laura. Do you want me to just share my screen while I read it? You can do both, please. Thank you. Of course. So the PTC recommends extending the framework. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Hold on one moment, please. extending the framework for fair evictions to tenants in buildings built within the last 15 years and tenants in units for less than a year who are not currently protected by the statewide renter protection law of AB 1482. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna ask this ahead of time. Um, I feel like there's some contradictory recommendations um, because in the last one, we were told that there wasn't much development in the city in the last 10, 10 to 15 years. And, and then we wanna do renters protection and we're only doing it for the people that have been in buildings for the last 15 years. Who am I protecting? Great question. And I would say that AB 1482 covers everybody already um, with just cause and the 5% uh, plus consumer price index cap. It's just that these folks here um, are the four that are left out of AB 1482. So we're covering the holes in AB 1482. Exactly, because the folks who are at those 20 year old buildings and such, they've already taken care of um, according to state law. Okay, Commissioner Savage, do you have any questions? But I appreciate the clarification because I also was confused. And um, uh, yeah, I, I agree that it should be uh, recommended. Okay, Commissioner again. I agree totally. I mean, I, I feel that I could vote on all of them. <laughs> I mean, so I, do I, have, I don't want to waste any I more time. With, I, I agree with you, but I do have to go through two parts this one. <laughs> no, 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 I know. <laughs> um, Commissioner um, Krause. Uh, I concur. This should be put in place. Okay. Um, Commissioner Everly. I agree. I do have one question. Is yeah. the PTC not recommending? So it looks like they're recommending it to cover the first two, um, the rental units and properties built within the last 15 years and rental units occupied by renters for less than one year, but they're still, PTC is not recommending for single family homes, not owned by a corporation and duplexes. Is that correct? correct? Yes, that right. is that is correct, and that was staff's initial recommendation that was brought to the PTC um, because it's going to be real tough um, to try and, and enforce those last two. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's just that it's going to be tough. Okay, so I'm going to ask a frank question. Um, is it an enforcement question? Is there also a political challenge to also getting that passed? Yes, and so it's both, I think. 
Okay, Commission, I'll take it. I'll take a recommendation. I'll make a recommendation. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Krauss. Oh, I was going to offer to um, compose this with you. I'll, you've done a great job so far tonight with the framing of it. So I'll, I'll leave it to yours too. Are you doing a motion? Yes. You're about okay. to do it. I thank need you. to share my screen then. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait a second. Okay. We move to support the eviction reduction program. Okay, if you could just hold off so Mary can catch up with you. No problem. That is excluded from the state legislation. And Lauren, what is the, the number? Lauren? AB 1482. Thank you. My pleasure. 1482. All right. Lauren, and you're missing before, 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 um, before we move ahead, I just want to make sure that the PTC's recommendation called it just cause. Is that correct? Yes. And there's oh. missing a word. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think, well, um, I was behind, so I'm sorry. What was moved to support the eviction? The eviction relocation oh, reduction, reduction program. Well, I'm sorry, reduction program. that is excluded from the uh, state legislation AB 1482. So I need to ask a question for clarification. Um, the PTC made two recommendations. There are four categories that are not included in state. Is this motion supporting the PTC's recommendation or are they, is it going for all four categories? I think it would be wiser to do the first two okay. so that we can get this passed. Excluded from the state legislate. Um, so I'm gonna, do you mind if I help with the language on this? Please, sir. Um, move to support the eviction relocation reduction program as presented. By the PTC. Focusing on the two areas that are excluded that is excluded from the state legislation AB 1482. So this will line us up with um, what was given to, to line up with what the PTC recommended. Are you comfortable with that, Commissioner Krauss? I am. I just want a verb change. The two yeah. areas that are. Yes. Thank you. I concur. I can support this. I think. We, I think. Do we have any other discussion? Um. I will second Commissioner Krause's motion since I helped write it. Um, is there any other uh, discussion from any of the commissioners? I would just recommend removing relocation from the motion. It's supposed to be reduction. Oh, there it goes, thank you. All right, um, any, any other discussion points? They aren't hearing none. I will take a vote from the top of the alphabet this time. Commissioner Everly, do you have a question? Actually, I have a comment, sorry. Yes. It's kind of delayed that I personally think that single family homes should have been added. I understand a political arena. 
-hmm. I also understand that that's different than duplexes with the renter, uh, with the owner living next to it. But single family homes that are for rent, mm -hmm. I think could have been added and maybe should. And maybe that's something that the city council still might want to discuss. Um, but I, of course, I, I will support and I vote. I, well, if we start voting. <laughs> no, wait, no, wait, wait. Um, I think, uh, Mary, we're back at discussion. That's not, hold, we'll hold the vote. Um, that's the only again. comment that I have. Okay. So we're sure again. I somewhat agree. I think our, our job is not to think, I mean, is to be bold. I mean, I really think ours is to see how many renters we could protect. I mean, that, those are the vulnerable people. And I think people in single homes are vulnerable. So I, I, I agree that we should put that in there. And, and if city council decides to take it out and not to go with our recommendations, at least we have been true to our mission. You bring it, both of you bring up a good point. Um, if either one of you would like to make a friendly amendment and ask the um, initial writer to make an adjustment to the motion, you have two options right now. You can ask to make a friendly amendment, um, make that proposal about um, what you'd like to add in. If the person that wrote the original motion doesn't accept your friendly amendment, you can do a substitute motion. So, um, if I'll go ahead any... and, try and take a stab at the friendly amendment. Thank you. Um, so I would move to add, um, to include single family homes owned by homeowners and not corporations. I, I believe that was the language. Yep, that was, that was the language. Is that right, Laura? Let me double check my slide here, but single family homes that are not owned by a corporation are currently excluded from AB 1482. That's okay. correct. And let's keep in mind, let's remember that we're talking about just cause eviction here. I mean, yeah. that's what we're yeah. talking about. And is that, if I remember correctly from your slide, that's 25% or 24% of the market in Palo Alto? 27% are single family homes, yes. So this is basically a third of our market that we're talking about. The, the only little caveat that I, I just want to make sure to, for clarification's sake, there are um, single family homes that are put into trusts and LLCs and things like that. Uh, and so that changes that number a little, but it's quibbling. It's quibbling. Okay. All right. I, um, Commissioner Krauss, will you accept the friendly amendment? I accept. Okay, we got a good motion here. I like it. I, I like it. Um, do we have any other discussion points? Okay, we'll start at the top of the alphabet for votes, Commissioner. I still hold my second, so we're good there. Commissioner Evelyn. Aye. Commissioner Krause. Aye. Commissioner Regeer. Aye. Commissioner Savage. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Good work. I'm, I'm actually, okay, I know I said eight o'clock, but you know, I at least want to get to four um, because I, I would feel a lot better if we got through the four major ones and then we started working through the other ones next month. Um, and next month will go a lot quicker because we don't have the presentation. We'll just be focusing on the motions. Um, and if we have questions on anything, we can reach out to Lauren. Um, Lauren, what is the next one? Can you please put it on the screen and read it for us? Of course. And so the PTC actually did not recommend, they didn't support this, uh, this policy. What they said was uh, to any of those four categories. So those four categories, uh, as we went through them before, were rental units in properties, 
uh, built in the last 15 years, rental units occupied by tenants for less than a year, single family homes. Um, I was going under four, number four. Right. Um, they both have to do with 1482. So I was just reading the, the locals okay. again. Okay. And uh, what, what was the original motion for four? I'm sorry. It's A-OK. -okay. Um, the PTC did not support number four. And number four is anti-gouging? Yes. It, or, which is that 5% plus consumer price index cap for rents. <clears throat> or as this New Yorker likes to say, rent control? There are some people who have said that this doesn't, this is actually too moderate to be considered rent control. Um, but there are other people who have said that it is a rent stabilization tactic as well. Yeah. So there, there are people in both parties, but I got you. <laughs> okay. And you gave a figure, somebody gave a figure, I think Emily Ramos gave a figure during her pu public comment, which was very revealing in that average rents in Palo Alto went up 55%, is that correct? Or do you have any data to support that, that point that she made? Actually, no, I don't know that I heard that part. Um, oh, it was a significant increase? Okay. Um, I, I Angie Evans. Angie. Ah, uh, okay. Made that comment, that statistic. Okay. I will say that I know that Angie is working uh, with the renters directly. So she has a really great wow. handle on what's happening at the ground level. Um, and that if folks are experiencing substantial increases, I, I think that I have seen them happen before um, when I was working as the BMR administrator. Um, so I would not be terribly surprised if they were happening. And why did the PTC not, um, not support? Not it? recommend? They didn't recommend because they felt like it was a really new law and they wanted to see how it played out at the state level. Um, and so they didn't want to mess with the state's law for something that could look akin to rent stabilization or rent control. All right, that's my question. Commissioner um, Savage, do you have any questions on this? Um, no, uh, no, not, I mean, I'm, I'm a little confused now. Um, so this is just a polite way of saying rent control, am I correct? So Maybe we can use the term that we were using before, Lauren, rent stabilization, yeah. if, if, and then maybe let's just not focus on the words, but maybe that might be easier to kind of digest. Yeah. And, and let's be clear, like rent control, it is a 1500 square foot apartment on the west side of Manhattan that they haven't changed the rent $0 since 1976. And the person that rented it the first time was the grandmother and then the mother moved in and now a third generation is living there and it's $300. This is, this is not rent control. This is, this is, um, this Anti -rent is high rent gouging. Yes. This is basically okay. to stop the abuse of vulnerable people that will get a notice in the mail that basically says your $3,000 rent went to $5,000 because I feel like this is what I want now and I can get. So I think there's a, I should not have used that term. I apologize for using that term and putting it in the atmosphere. Okay, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I'm, no, I, I'm fine. Okay. Commissioner Regeer. You're muted. I, I think that, I mean, this has been brought up as rent control years and years and years. I mean, like, I think it's like 20, more than 20 years ago to Palo Alto again. And I think that it's very important and the stabilization, especially for, for, for 
people that have owned the property for a long time and then they die and then their heirs take over and they want to just, which is happening. And then they want to charge a lot more and it is a gouging. And um, so I, I rec I, I have nothing to say because I don't, I, I, I support this completely. So may I jump in? Uh -huh. yes, oh, I just wanted to just clarify that these regulations do apply and they are in place already, but we're trying to close the gap to cover these, those four bullet points that we had listed on the, that slide. So um, I know this has been a little bit confusing between these two. So I just wanna make sure folks understand that. And that's the idea is that are you supporting or would you like to support the expansion to cover these additional four items or do you think it's okay to leave it as is today? Um, I've already talked enough. I'll come back around when we go to motions. Um, Commissioner Krause? Um. 1482 is, is you are correct, is brand new, stinking new uh, legislation. However, I think we may want to address the four uncovered categories as we did before. And we may want to include the excluded category of new properties, um, one, two, and three mm -hmm. is what I'm suggesting. Mind you, the argument against this to council will have lines of realtors going out the door, but it's our job to take care of the vulnerable and the renters that are growing in the city of Palo Alto. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Evans. We just have a couple of comments. First, that were, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, but we're talking about AB 1482 caps it at a maximum of 10%, correct? Yes. So they can so, raise it 10% a year. They can raise it 5% plus the consumer price index, which is inflation. And there is no way, no time, no how that they could ever um, account for anything more than 10%, but usually it's smaller than 10%, that inflation cost. I think that the reality is that in Palo Alto, they use these increases in rent to dislocate people. And this is how you end up having people, you know, losing homes all the time. Right. Um, Those are oftentimes referred to as illegal evictions. Um, people charging skyrocketing rents to try and get folks to move out or harassing tenants, things like that. And that's one of the ways that we're trying to make that stop. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe that as the Human Relations Commission that we should be you know, supporting to include all four that are not included. And honestly, I feel like the 5% plus the rate of inflation is fair. And every time somebody leaves, they can, you know, rent it for whatever they want. So, and I'm a little bit dismayed that the PTC voted not to recommend this to the city council. Yeah, I, as this is the thing that I think is, is the challenge with state laws and local context when, 30% of your property, your rental property is single family houses in Palo Alto, but it might, it's not that in the San Francisco or LA environment where that law makes way more sense. I think this is where local government, we as a body can speak to the fact and actually 
get a state law, take the protections that are given by state law, but also make them fit our context. You know, um, because I've seen it, I've heard it. I've heard it from people that rent $6,000 a month and that, you know, and they can and they pay it. And then, you know, two months later, they get a, a letter in the mail and they want $8,000. And this is, the, you know, and I can only imagine as you go down the socioeconomic scale where you don't have lawyers and legal defense, how badly this happens. So I want to make a motion um, if, if we can, um, if we can, can you, before Mary can push me, Lauren, can you, see, um, can you put up the motion that was brought for number four? Absolutely. And that was the one that the PTC did not recommend. Did not. Uh, I'm, I'm all right with that. Okay. Um, give me one second. There we go. So there we have it. The PTC does not recommend extending rent increase limits to housing units not protected by the statewide anti-gouging law. Okay. Mary, do you see that? Because I'm just going to make two changes to that HRC recommends extending the rent increase limits to housing units not protected by the state by anti-gouging law, AB 1482. You got that, Mary? Yeah, I'm just starting to type it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me know when you want to take over the screen, Mary, and I'm happy to take it down. Okay, I have it. All right, if you can put it on the screen for the commission to see. Can I? So we need to say the HRC recommends. the extending rent increase limits to housing. Yep, I think that's what we're gonna go with. All right. Um, do I have a second? Yeah. 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 This one's gonna go down real quick. I will take um, Commissioner Regeer because she's first on the on my screen. So Commissioner Regeer seconds the motion. Okay, we'll start at the top of the alphabet. Commissioner Evelyn. Aye. Commissioner Kraus. Aye. Commissioner Regeer. Aye. Um, Commissioner Savage? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Um, HRC, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, first of all, we want to thank Lauren and um, Claire for um, really putting together an excellent report. I ask that we be very, very prepared um, with questions on the next few ones. Ask them early if we email them, do all the research so that when we get to voting next month, um, we can just go right to the issues. Um, and I think that will be super, super helpful because we want to make sure that we don't tank, tie up their time if we don't do all of our research and our question asking. All right. Yes, Commissioner Krause. Um, Could we ask Lauren 
to provide a copy of her presentation to all of us. That'd be great. Um, is that all right, Lauren? Absolutely. And I already sent a copy to Mary, I believe. Um, and if you guys have questions before I see you again, um, hold on. What I is the question? question? Yes, Claire. I have a procedural question. Do you have to formally continue the item? Just want to make sure. I'm just going to, I'll put it at the, I'll put it on the, okay. the um, during it at the end of the meeting where we said tentative agenda for the regular meeting. I'll just put it there. Great. Thank you. You're and welcome. do we know what that date is? I'm horrible with calendars. Minka, do you know? So, is it September 9th? Yes. September 9th. Yes, September 9th. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Okay. Before we go, Mink, I have a question. I understand it's the second Thursday of every month that we have our meetings. Correct. Is there any way that they can be moved or no? It's that would really depend on a combination of the ability of the commission, ability of when we're back in person, that there is a room that we are able to meet in, ability of the Mid Peninsula to be able to broadcast us that they don't have another um, commission meeting or another obligation at the same time. It's a it's a combination of um, many things. Commissioner Everly, um, do you have a record? Do you have a challenge? Well, right now I'm booked to be out of the country that week because it's Labor Day week. Oh, to go. So what we can do, I know Commissioner Savage is also not able to be here. So then we will be, we don't will be a commissioner of three. So at the end of the meeting, if there is a desire um, that staff um, does some kind of polling to see if we could meet later, we will not be able to meet earlier because there will be the review of the HISRAP allocations and moving it earlier will be a big challenge for that subcommittee. So we can talk um, later. Um, we can look into the time frames that people might be gone because for for if it's his rep and this to have only three commissioners there, that will not be uh, sufficient whatsoever. Um, can we note that it can't be moved to the 16th for many of us, because that's the beginning of Yom Kippur. We would certainly doodle to make sure that we we wouldn't just automatically move it. Oh, we would okay. be in dialogue with the commissioners to see what works. And we always um, do our best to avoid um, any religious holiday. Well, thank you. The chair is extremely sensitive to religious holidays. So we're not going to do that. Okay, so Mary and I will work with this on the commission, but if those of you who are going to take um, some are not available, if you could just um, maybe give me your availability. If any of you are gonna be gone in the month of September, why don't you email me your availability? So, because doing a doodle is a very thankless task and um, I don't want to start and just have to start over again. So I'd like to start with some good information. So if you could email me, that would be appreciated. All right. Um, thank you, Lauren, um, Claire. Thank you so much for the phenomenal work. What I want to give, this was a lot of heavy lifting. So I want to do two things. Um, I want to first switch our um, break time. Uh, I'm, for, I'm sorry, I want us to do a five minute break, let people just get up, clear the head, drink water. And um, we have a guest that has patiently waited for two hours. So I, I would like to change item three and two, um, just out of respect for their time. Is, is that all right with the commission? Okay. Yes. I hear no significant like, pushback. So please take a five minute break. We will be back at eight.
20. It's 8.14, let's come back at 8.20, and we will be dealing with the report back on 100 community conversations on race. And if people can ensure they turn off their cameras and off their um, audio, that would be appreciated.
You're on mute, Coloma. We have a very prompt group. Um, you figure I would have learned how to use the Zoom machine a year later. <laughs> it didn't work for me. Um, first of all, I want to say, um, before I go much further, I've asked um, former vice chair, former commissioner, um, Valerie Stinger, to really come forward and speak on this matter. Um, she really spearheaded this and she treated the, you know, she came off the commission, she chose to, but she didn't drop the project in the middle and she really led this effort. So I'm eternally grateful for her efforts and I felt it would be disingenuous for me to give a report that she did all the work on. So Valerie, if you may, I would love for you to come on and give us the recap of this report. Okay. Valerie there? Or did she put us on pause? I, I will give her a call. Thank you, ma'am. Because she missed my great introduction. Okay, she is aware that the agenda change was made. Okay. Hi, Valerie. Good evening. You, you missed my great introduction. You're going to have to go back and watch it. <laughs> but but um, vice, former vice chair, great commissioner, great asset to the, the community and city of Palo Alto. I want to turn this over to Valerie Stinger to give the report on this. You ready, Valerie? I'm just trying, I'm just going to share. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening, staff, council members. My apologies for not quite understanding the schedule change. Uh, the 100 Conversations has been a part of my life for many months, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share it with you. The motivation underpinning the timing of, this, of the conversations is captured in this sidebar from protest to promise and from reflection to action. The HRC had committed to the council, to the city council that we would convene community conversations on race and belonging. The community was coming off of a summer of protests, a year of reading and an excellent 21 day challenge, which was an in-depth study of race relations, of race issues. We hoped by picking this timing that we could put a stake in the ground and turn things from in-depth to personal and positive and from reflection into action to make some changes in, in race relations in our city. I'm going to be as concise as I can. Um, I'm going to 
frame the approach in the next few slides, summarize the discussion and the conversations, and offer some proposals for your consideration. Uh, the approach that we took was to do a conversation in two parts. The first dealt with uh, the experience with race. People said after a year of thinking that they really wanted a chance to answer, ask questions of neighbors, to probe different experiences, lived experiences in Palo Alto, and to have some quantitative time, or qualitative time with the questions at hand. They all, we also wanted to have some concrete proposals for going forward. We didn't want to have another study of what uh, the contemporary lived experience was. We wanted to be able to make some recommendations to change the experience in our city. So what we ended up with was something that's very exciting, but also a little bit of a two-headed monster. The value was in the process as well as the answers. What we ended up with was 32 conversations were recorded. We know that more than that were held. Some people did not record their answers. 206 people participated in these conversations which lasted one and a half to two hours. The sample was diverse, although it was not representative of the city, statistically representative. Um, it looked like 48% of the sample resided in downtown. Uh, then other sections represented were the west and the south and a small percent in the hills. Uh, the sample was skewed to women, 75% of the sample was female. About half were in the 56 to 75 year age segment. And it was basically about 75% uh, white, Caucasian, European population. There are some limitations. The sample is self-selected. Uh, so while it is somewhat diverse, it is not statistically representative of Palo Alto. It, I don't think that the groups that did not opt in would have drastically different recommendations or sentiments, but they might have less enthusiasm for the findings that we report, and they might not endorse the recommendations. Uh, the period that we did the conversations was basically May 25th to Juneteenth, and I thought that was a brilliant time to do the conversations. We were celebrating or acknowledging the uh, murder of George Floyd a year ago and ending on Juneteenth. But in the end, we did have to compete with end of year activities, graduations, schools, summer vacations. Uh, California's statewide eviction moratorium was scheduled to end June 30th. Um, and housing advocates who had been hopeful that they would be collecting groups and putting to assembling groups of com com participants found themselves conflicted and were scrambling to push legislators to extend the moratorium. So we lost a segment of our population and publicity for our events was nearly non-existent, a result of limited volunteer capacity and budget. Okay, what did what was the discussion? This was basically a qualitative, no, not basically, essentially, almost totally a qualitative study. 
but we could quantitate one important uh, parameter, and that is that 30% of the participants had not had a conversation about race in Palo Alto before. And then we also found that issues of belonging extend beyond race, even to the dominant population segments. We broke down the discussion elements into three parameters, learning, emotions, and experiences, because we believe that, or that those three elements predict actions. The learning centered on white privilege. The finding that we saw was that white privilege existed and we talked about the ways it manifested itself, both racially and economically. The takeaway shed light on the fact that even though we are a progressive city, there's still growth and still room for new learnings about white privilege. And that was with a progressive sample in a progressive city. The experiences that people shared about surveillance, um, racist incidents that they confronted, refusal to rent, uh, uh, refusals to get job interviews, uh, car purchases were difficult to negotiate, uh, were significant in the time, but also significant that they, that experience predicted future behavior. The takeaway from emotions was that um, a portion of the population is just beginning to get it. There is sadness that racism is so prevalent in this city, and there's anger at uh, the experience that people have shopping, negotiating for rents or jobs. We had some activities. One was called the Four, Four Corners, and people, acknowledged, people told us that these were the richest discussions because we really had to think from the perspective of four people. Putting ourselves in the committer's shoes generated a lot of thought about why someone would do that. I should just make a comment about the way I've structured these slides. The comment, the bullet at the top, some emotional expressions were general while others were specific. There was expressions of anger, sadness, and just the beginning of understanding were the takeaways that my a subcommittee had from the actual discussion quotes. And those quotes are reflected in the subsets. So these come from the participants. These are our statements. Personal commitments. We want to people to respond in two ways to what changes they would make going forward, what changes they would personally make and what changes they wanted at the city level. Um, there was pushing for infrastructure change, um, being advocates at city council, saying that they would stand up at local school meetings um, and support more housing. There was, uh, a personal, there were personal commitments to community building, to um, making the lived experience of some, the learning experience of others, to get to know people, to build community, um, to continue the conversations. There were personal commitments to build skills, 
uh, not to be a bystander, but to be an upstander. Uh, that said, there might be more room for what can I do personally? What can I do differently in the way I approach a person of another race, the way I deal with um, observations that I make of racism in the city? Um, there's a personal involvement that we didn't see universally and that we might want to look at more carefully. I went through the uh, discussion really briefly, but I wanted to thank the 206 people who participated. We have pages of quotes and reactions to the discussions that they participated in. But I wanted to save time for going forward. As we were looking at the output from the conversations, we saw the, the subcommittee and I saw that there were barriers to being or becoming a belonging community, including economic disparities, racism, classism, and stereotypes. So to enhance inclusion and increase the sense of belonging, we came up with these recommendations for your consideration. The HRC will recommend, will convene civic and community partnerships around four topics, policing, education, housing, and community engagement. And the HRC will propose belonging as a city priority in 2022. If the HRC chooses to do this, they might look to work in conjunction with the Race and Equity Task Force, which updates policies and services in September of this year. This priority would allow a deeper dive into questions such as what does it mean to belong? How is it manifested in the community? Does belonging mean something to a different age or population segment? Who in our city believes they don't belong or belong no longer? And then, what do I need to do? What's my personal responsibility? Looking at the uh, partnerships and the discussion, the partnerships that the HRC would consider, the first is policing. And our thinking under that is that the HRC will assess the need, the potential utility, the scope of responsibility for a citizen's oversight committee. That committee would address police accountability and transparency, complement the independent police auditor, and add specific definition to the HRC's liaison role. Another aspect of that might be that the HRC will conduct forums on topics related to policing. One year ago, we had a similar forum on eight can't wait. It brought in outside expertise as we talked about or as you talked about earlier this evening. And it included the HRC, the city manager, Palo Alto Police Department, and city council representatives. It would it did provide, the one that we did, the Form on 8 Can't Wait provided an informative foundation for decision-making. And we see that similar forums could provide a good foundation and a forum for questions particular to Palo Alto. The other area that we wanted to look at to increase inclusion and belonging was education. The recommendation here is that the HRC will initiate a convening of stakeholders, and that would include representatives of PAWSD, the Palo Alto Advisory Committee on Early Care and Education, 
and faith groups to consider an early education program. The implementation would clearly be the responsibility of those groups that the HRC would bring together, but it might include family events, playground dates, modules, training, teaching modules for in-class use, and assessment of the need for staff, staff sensitivity training. We heard a lot of ideas about education and they are not shown here because the HRC typically does not make recommendations to POSD. This was seen as something that would be within our, within your scope. House, housing is clearly an important topic. And the recommendation here is that the HRC will identify ways to identify and address barriers to accessing housing. The discussion groups still felt that housing was not equally available, either retail or rental housing to all segments of the population. I can't address whether that's valid or not, but we can say that we would look at that and to clear, be clear that all the deeds have been rewritten to exclude racial discriminatory statements. And the HRC would advocate for a housing stock that meets the needs of a socially and economically diverse community. Community engagement is the fourth area that we recommend looking, considering. And here the HRC would form, a, the recommendation is the HRC will form a consortium of civic and community organizations to tackle community engagement. It's acknowledging that there are limited resources in the city and the community. There are similar visions and intent that could be capitalized on by combining resources. Implementation could be programming, activities, forums, study sessions, citizen oversight. We would ask city staff to take responsibility for the initial structure and the statement of purpose. But then a board or an entire group would establish annual priorities. This would be much like the Healthy Cities Initiative that uh, was active in the city for three to five years and from which came a number of activities including um, the anti-vaping study of uh, a year, it was a year ago, uh, I guess 18 months ago, sorry. Some examples of things that people asked for in the um, conversation groups were in the hundred conversations were uh, more conversation. There was a real commitment to continue the dialogue and maybe it would be something like come to the table that could be tailored to a city conversation. Um, seminars and training, a rigorous study of local racism was proposed, uh, focus groups, baseline programming. Uh, I'm gonna let you read the examples. The extensions of a 21 day equity challenge um, is something that's very concrete and receives a lot of interest, a lot of people suggested. Um, messaging, it would be great if the city adopted some consistent messaging. A get out the vote campaign, not to support a candidate or a position but to inform, emphasis on informed citizenry, to make sure that we had 100%, we strove to have 100% participation in our elections. And then events, mini grants for block parties, cultural events in the city. I note here that service clubs such as Rotary and Kiwanis want to help the city put on these events and they specifically talk to that in the circles that they participated in. Today, I sat in a meeting with uh, 
YCS Youth Community Services, and they're doing a program for September 11th, the 20th anniversary of September 11th, a day of service. It's a combination of service groups in Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. And they're doing it under the uh, vision of community building. They would be interested in supporting activities. The League of Women Voters has a special committee on equity and social justice. They are continuing to ask, what can we do next? Um, I think there's a lot of energy around community engagement and a lot of partnerships to uh, make the implementation successful. So closing thoughts on the program. The conversations were described as rich, encouraging, and profound. Participants appreciated the opportunity for a ser serious discussion. Report and follow through are anticipated. The key now is for the HRC to actually roll the output into an executive summary of findings and to use that to create and drive a change agenda. Let's get this done. A repeating theme was that Palo Alto has evolved to a classist city and it may be more classist than racist. Participants felt their sense of belonging in the neighborhoods was decreasing over time. It used to be, I, I heard one mayor several years ago, several generations ago say when Palo Alto walked into the room, there was a, a feeling that Palo Alto's in the room and that doesn't exist as much anymore. At the same time, Palo Alto has a reputation for being wealthy, elitist, white, privileged, out of touch. These discussion groups, these participants felt that we had strong values and we were more of a city of values than just rich suburbs. And it was these values that meant that we might take this on successfully. Before I close, I want to acknowledge some contributions that were extremely important. Megan Swayze Fogarty, in addition to her high energy and creative thinking, was instrumental in introducing us to Mohammed Soriano Bilal and Shalila Kotadia, who gave us rich counsel and made the uh, idea a reality. I had an assessment subcommittee that went through the uh, printouts that Mary Constantino provided for us almost daily. We looked at the questions, how we would sum up the richness of them and how we would turn them into recommendations. And we took that to a community advising committee made up of a broad group of people as you can see. So 13 months ago, the HRC was asked to document the history and contemporary lived experience of black and brown Palo Alto. You now have the opportunity to move that from documentation to change makers. I think it's been an exciting year and the, pa the past year has been exciting, but I think the, the coming year is going to be more exciting and richer. And I turn the discussion over to you. Thank you. Chair, you're muted. I figure I know how to make this thing work by now. Um, first of all, I want to thank Valerie um, for this passion project that she's worked really hard on. Um, I've sat in on several assessment subcommittees and I've sat in, in meetings with Megan and the, and the two uh, diversity inclusion experts from Stanford. And I feel like this is well researched, great scientific data. Um, 
the outcomes are based on people's responses because there were some things that surprised us, but we didn't um, hide behind, we, we didn't drive the outcomes based on our perception. So I'm really grateful for that. Right now, I wanna, this one I'm gonna run a little bit differently because we're gonna have to have a discussion on some items here, but I wanna um, open it up to public comment. I noticed Mr. James has his hand up. Hold on just a minute, I'll wait till Mary gets Thank you. Uh... Okay, Mr. James, you have two minutes. Go ahead, please. Okay, Valerie, uh, again, I want to thank you. The last time I tried to acknowledge you by uh, reading a little story that uh, my mother published uh, in her book on J her experiences with James Baldwin. Again, what you've done has been extraordinary. So in reference to policing, um, you know, I'm referred to by the press often as the Palo Alto police critic. I prefer to be uh, considered the best practices advocate for policing. Um, I'm going to be meeting with uh, Assistant Chief Bender. We've reached out to each other on issues that I think are unresolved, canines, tasers, lack of recruiting African-Americans, and a variety of things. And again, uh, the Zach Perone, the captain that was promoted after uh, racist comments to a black officer and the use of the N-word is still unresolved. We don't speak about it here in Palo Alto. Uh, I don't know how we can have a, a, a blunt conversation on race without resolving that issue. I'm puzzled by why it was only, you know, the 75% white females. I, I didn't, I, and I apologize. I think about race issues every single day of my life, but I was, I, I don't know how I missed being part of these hundred conversations, but uh, I am committed to ongoing conversations on that. I think I would like to see not only white supremacy that you've talked about and white privilege, but, but also caste supremacy. And I, I know you probably all know about Isabel Workerson's extraordinary book on caste, the origins of our discontent and her linking racism and casteism. And, you know, we have a large East Asian population and there's caste shaming that goes on in the Silicon Valley. And I'd like to have some East Asians present and talk about that issue, connect it up with racism. And I'm also uh, interested at some point in talking about the Racial Justice Act and the use of uh, you know, jury selection process. And now that we have a, a member of the Independent Defense Council, maybe we can put the importance of being able to, to talk about race to juries. And finally, I'll let mm. the DA's race is so critical on race. We've Thank got you, it. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more speakers. Oh, right. Um, first of all, um, I want to do a first round um, of impressions on the report. And then uh, we'll see where we go from there. But we'll do some motions, some questions, some answers. We'll start at the top of the alphabet. So we go with um, Commissioner Evan. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank um, Valerie Stinger for all the work. It, this was amazing. Um, I cannot imagine how much work was put into it. I actually did see some of the, I, some of the, I don't know, marketing um, on Instagram, I believe, for the city of Palo Alto, mm -hmm. and maybe some flyers too. Um, so I did see it around. But again, I am a white woman. Um, so I don't know if it ended up getting... Um, focused on women in general. Um, I am, do, do you know wh why 75% women? And I noticed that it's a lot of downtown. Was it done at, um, I don't know, retirement homes, a lot of these conversations? Where did they take place? They took, may I answer chair? Yes, go. Um, they took place in parks, in homes. Um, I, I can't explain why downtown, that was a total surprise to me. Um, they, there were, there was one group in, it ended up being one group in Channing House, um, but that was not particularly a large group and there were men in that group as well. Um, I just attribute, 
a lot of the publicity we got came from the League of Women Voters. And that may have brought in women. I mean, that clearly brought in women. Um, the other comment, I guess, is, well, because of COVID, some people might have not felt comfortable speaking to strangers as well. Well, we, a lot of them were done by Zoom. When we, when we set, started, we expected they would all be done on Zoom remotely. But then as we moved into the process, it uh, attracted more in-person conversations. Okay. But we had Kiwanis and Rotary. Those were mixed circles. We had, we had synagogues and churches. Yes. Um, I'm, I think this is great because we have, you know, so many comments and um, an outline of what they want us to do. I just wish it was a little bit more inclusive and reflected the community a little bit more. And actually, I would love to hear from other people on how can we make it more inclusive so that we're not representing, you know, when we go forward um, with these comments and wishes that we're not just representing this part of the population. I think, can I use to that I think that's can I respond to that there you go yeah I think that's an excellent idea and I think there's a real logical flow we wouldn't have to start at the same zero point we could be testing alternatives and exploring different programs uh, there is interest in looking at other segments of the population the East a the Asian population in Palo Alto so there's lots of ways we could extend the conversation to make it more inclusive and not be, and still advance the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, um, Commissioner Krams. I, I, I'm just looking up some data really quickly and when we look at the population of Palo Alto, it is 58.97% um, white. So, so we, if you actually look at the data, we actually skew more that way. And we also skew with the average age in the 40s or median age in the 40s. So some of the skewing isn't being um, biased. It's actually being us. I think the issue, the bigger issue, I, I think the, the male part is a bigger issue, but I think you can only get so many people that are in, um, in age, in certain categories because the community provides that. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, Commissioner Krause. My goodness. I commend you, Valerie. This has become a passion and a driving force for you. And the data that you've compiled is outstanding. I too, like Commissioner Eberly, would love to see it broadened even further. But what you've done for us is you've created a foundation and a foundation on which we can only expand. So I am truly very interested in data. I'm a data wonk at the end of the day. And I'd love to have a more in-depth conversation with you about how you constructed this and where you want to go because you're living with this data. And you'll know far better than any of us at this point where this can be taken, how it can be expanded, what populations can be included, such as the chair's recommendation on the Asian hate area and ID and 
anti-Semitism, which is on a rise that we have never seen in this country and outside this country. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Krauss. Commissioner right here. I just want to thank, thank you, Valerie, and, and what you did was very um, good, but it doesn't surprise me that it is mostly women. Look at our commission. We're white women. Look, I mean, I, I, white women like to talk. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound, but, but it doesn't surprise me that that's... It's the perfect observation. Thank you, Commissioner Regular. <laughs> All right, um, Commissioner Savage. Say Commissioner Savage? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, yeah, well, you know, e echoing all the others. Um, um, yeah, great job. Um, you know, amazing results. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, uh, Valerie, and I guess Paloma too, um, was there like a any really big surprises after analyzing all the results? And so can you tell me what the biggest surprise was? The, I'll go first and then Valerie can go. Um, the biggest surprise to me was the, we, we've already highlighted that the, it's majority white women, um, um, slightly older demographic, and a consistent drumbeat was they didn't feel like they belonged in the city. And I, as a black man, I was stunned to see that trend be continually rehammered into the results of people, people who I would assume feel like they should belong, don't feel like they belong. Valerie? That was certainly my biggest surprise. I think the second biggest surprise for me was um, the number of people who didn't um, appreciate um, white privilege, not appreciate, didn't, didn't expect white privilege. Um, to hear the number of people who said, we were shocked, we didn't know. It was like, mm -hmm. That really surprised me. So we have a report. Um, has a lot of great recommendations. Um, I would like to move ahead with sending this report um, to the city council. Uh, I'm in full support of all the recommendations and all data given. Um, so I'd like to open a discussion about moving this report forward to council. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I see head nodding. I agree that it should okay. be sent. <laughs> okay, um, I'll make a motion. Um, I move that we submit this report to see. Yes, Minka. If you could you wait for Mary. You know, I was about to ask Commissioner Krause to write the motion for me because she's done a great job, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my hand on it. I move that um, we forward the HRC, or the HRC forward the 100 conversation report to the city council. Mm -hmm. It already, that's it. Mary, don't have to type anymore. I believe it already includes recommendations. It already has evidential items. Um, Minka, you have a look. Tell me what. I, I have a look because I just want to be sure because I am writing the uh, the portion of the staff report that is going to. This is actually going to policy and services first. Um, that is reflective of the hundred um, conversations um, project program. Now, is that inclusive or exclusive of the recommendations? Are you gonna come back as an HRC and say, yes, we're gonna do all these things? Cause I need to say in my report, um, this is a forwarding of the report, the HRC in future meetings will be- um, Yes. 
Yes, because um, I believe that this converse, the framework on the recommendations can start applying to other groups and um, categories such as the Asian American, as Commissioner Krause said, the Asian American community, we can start doing some investigation into the Latinx community. There, th this is a foundational piece and a lot of these activities I believe will have some long-term, how can I say, um, synthesis with some other work we're doing, so. Okay, so it's foundational and then at what point would you be going back to those recommendations or identifying the first next steps? After, after council comes back to us, because if I identify a first step and they think they want another first step, I think it's a, it'll be a waste of time. Okay, because I'm still trying to understand uh, of, of yeah. just reflecting these are, these are um, some recommendations forwarded by the subcommittee that worked on it. Um, the agency accepted a report and will be in future um, would, going back would, to consider these recommendations. I would actually form in it these recommendations were received from the community that participated mm -hmm. in the 100 conversations. Yes. Because the subcommittee is, it showed great fidelity to the data. They didn't come up with this out of their own. Commissioner Regeer, you have your hand up. Oh, I was just waiting for you to finish because I, I didn't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. I, I just had some concerns about the recommendation thing, but you're, you're kind of clarifying it now. Yes. I'm just, okay. I, I'm just waiting. That's yeah, so so I believe, and this is my take, and it might be the wrong thing, and you can give us advice. I believe that we need to, to give the city council the most unadulterated recommendations from the community. That was our goal. Um, I believe that after they do it, council had, I would believe council has a mandate to act because it's very clear that there's something there and they should send it back to HRC to work through what's there and how we can expand the work. Okay. So, but you're asking them just to do in essence what the HRC did right now. You're asking them to receive the report, to ask any questions, but that you are you asking for them to give comment on any of the recommendations before the HRC considers them again? I'm, I'm really trying to get clarity. Um, they can give comment and direction and ask questions, but I want it to be, um, I want this to be the start of a deeper HRC work plan, not yeah. go to council and die. Right. I, I think my, my observation there would be if they you know, because we have not heard <clears throat> what the commissioners think of the recommendations to uh, haven't filtered through them or maybe reworded them slightly, then to give them to the council already um, when there could be a little bit of, you know, cleaning up of them or they might have some concerns. Oh my gosh, is the HRC going to do that when actually the HRC hadn't really um, made that decision yet, so. Okay, um, let's talk to the commission. <laughs> um, I, I've seen these recommendations and I've seen like six re re revisions of this report before it came for you. So I'm very comfortable with the recommendations. Um, what I'm willing to do is this. If there is anything that makes anybody uncomfortable or if people want to have a little bit more time with the recommendations, bringing recommendation review as, um, as part of our September meeting so we can tighten it up and give and send it to, um, and send it to council as a tighter package. Uh, you, you won't have time with that. With that, my understanding, this is going mid-September, so there wouldn't be... There wouldn't be time for that unless okay. you know it, it no we're not we're not slowing the train yeah okay let's 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 take a step back are there any recommendations in your pack in the packet that you have questions on or concerns about yes commissioner 
Did, so did you my say my concern is that this recommendation is coming from a very small percentage of the population of the city. Okay. It's the sample size and the way it skews. So I would like it to be a starting point. Mm -hmm. But again, I and I don't know if we do this with more conversations or we as a commission distill some things and then put it out there for comment or try to get survey the city. I don't know. I'm brand new <laughs> to the commission. No, but no. Um, I would like to get more input so that it mirrors the community a little bit more. So I, I, I think that's valid. I think um, maybe we should stop, say that this is a starting point and we want to investigate more. Um, One could observe that the recommendations are the HRC's response to what they heard and what they would be working on and the work of community engagement is going to happen in living out these recommendations. So I, I, this is, you know, to a certain extent, some of these, you know, involve meeting with members of the public, but they could give, let's use the childcare example for one. So the HRC and PAUSD and the faith groups can give their feedback to the HRC once that meeting happens. So I see this more as, yes, did this come from the input from the results, but these are really what the HRC will do. And when they're living it out, then they're inviting the members of the public during these meetings to continue the conversation. Am I over speaking, um, Chair or um, Valerie? I, 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 think, I think you would hit the vein that I was trying to hit and Commissioner, I, I don't wanna speak to Commissioner Everly, but I think what, what I was hearing from her was a similar thing. Like this is a foundation, a starting point um, I think there's more dialogue and more information and it's led us to some interesting places. I, I really love one of the initial recommendations of belonging, being a focus of the city, because I, I think that alone helps drive the conversation forward. Yes, Dean Shepard here. I want to stay focused. We have, we already went through our work plan. We already decided what we've done. We had months and months not getting to it. And I think that that would be a good discussion for the retreat in January, because if we take, I, I just think that that discuss, you know, 75% were women saying that they don't feel belonging. I, I, I think, I, I, I just have problems. We have, we have, we have a work plan right now. And, and we need to get that done. And I'm not saying I'm trying to disregard this, but that's all this information and even more can be done at our retreat where we set our new agenda for the work plan. Then we'll have, maybe have more information, but to go, go forward, I think that we, we need more input if we're gonna take other things and do it at the retreat. So, we already have a work plan, we have a work plan. So item number one on the work plan is this, this inclusion and belonging. Right, and that's always been one of my big things, but we've never, um, well, I mean, we couldn't even, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound, people don't wanna belong from the things that the city, what I'm saying is that how many people, we had 200 people, 206 people, 75% white women, and they're saying they don't feel like they're belonging, but they're the ones that showed up. I mean, I, I, I'm just saying that that is a good one, but I think it takes more, more, um, I'm trying to be positive here, but I don't want to spend my time, how do I get more, more people who are saying they don't belong in this age group? I mean, I think that we, if we have meetings about belonging, it's around housing, it's about um, how they can participate in, in, in their life, life, about rent control, We've already had that approved. We've already had that approved. You know, we've already had approved belonging. So we don't need to say we're gonna work on it. That is our work plan. 
is my thought. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, um, I have an idea. Um, there, there's quite a, well, quite a few action ideas here. Um, I wonder if we could just, you know, I mean, send, send the list as is, but also, you know, choose three items, you know, or two items that you want to immediately, you know, the pri prioritize, just prioritize one, two, and three, and then all the others as well. I mean, this way, at least council, you know, these are the three important things you want to tackle, and we can go from there. Okay, I'm looking. I'm looking at the. I got my my report here. I mean, so it's interesting. Um, you know, the first point I think is critical. Um, HRC convenes civic and community partnerships around policing, education, housing, and community engagement. I, I think um, the reality is these are these are the issues that have to be worked on. Um, and I like HRC proposal belonging to the city priority in conjunction with the race and equity task force, which updates policy of service in September, 2021. I think um, those are two very significant and tangible pieces that address, address significant issues in our city. And I mean, we do dive deeper in those different areas and flesh them out later in the thing, in the, in the recommendations. But if you do those two pieces, I think it starts put, it, it helps us move the ball forward and really address belonging. Um, and to Commissioner Riviera's point, it deals, with, it deals with the issues of the community, not just with the demographic issue. Could we accomplish some of what you're talking, what you're addressing, Chair, uh, yeah. with some of the text on page 15? What's page 15? Which is going forward. Oh. oh, that's the exact text I was using yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Because I like that text. That's that's it. I know, and I'm trying to figure out how we encompass that, but uh, uh, look, these are things that we are concerned about and we want the city of Palo Alto to begin to address the whole concept of belonging. 
belonging. And this is the first step we took mm -hmm. in having these 100 conversations mm -hmm. that we are now going to dive further in. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and, and, and Minka, um, you've been doing this a long time. Um, you've been doing this, a long, I've only done it for six years. So maybe you have a bigger sample size. In the middle of a pandemic, we were able to get 206 people to have a conversation on, on belonging, race, ethnicity in the city of Palo Alto. Have we ever been able to have a conversation that large around this in the city? I would say not that I know of. I mean, it was the being different together conversations that you um, that and Valerie worked on. Um, that was 80 people though. Five years ago, and that was, and that was 80 people. So I, you know, I'd leave this good work to the commission. I, I kind of like where um, Commissioner Kraus and Commissioner um, Chair Smith are going, is that is there a, a feeling of comfort of just that first statement that has some very broad categories and that also respects the feelings of um, Commissioner Regeer in saying, mm. okay, you know, can, can you, you know, accept those four areas and then what you actually do as next steps that takes into account what you have heard from um, the community mm -hmm. and looks into the, the capacity of the commission mm -hmm. as well. I, I, so I think it's absolutely if we're going to put a cover sheet on this, and I know how um, the packet for city city council is like five, 600 pages. So giving them these cover sheet items and then saying you can reference more specifics in the packet if you want, you know, cause I know um, um, council member um, Allison will, 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 she's going to read it all, but not every council member is going to read every detail right. of it. Right. Um, I think that's a great start. And I think it, it doesn't invalidate or shunt aside or number, number one work plan item and or our number one work plan item or most significant community-based action where we had library, PA, USD, staff, Stanford. We don't invalidate that work. And we are also um, moving forward with something that council charged us with. So right. I think. But I would also, um, you know, think about how this, so I'm waiting to hear back for instance, you know, in my portion of the report that's going to um, the Policy and Services Committee, how many pages I have. I may have two pages to synthesize this whole process and the, the, the next steps. I would be cautious because, as you know, the council has, especially council as a whole, but then once you get to their responsibilities on you know, on these uh, other committees, that is an enormous amount of information for them to take in. And I, I often prefer that if, if a group feels like they are closer to the information and have spent more time with the information, I would prefer that you pass on to them what you're, you're, you would, you're recommending and ask their input um, or say, this is where we're going so far, we will go back to it, but just, this is it. What do you think you may come back with um, something that is really an asset to, to the work, but if, if someone hasn't spent as much time, it, it may take the work off to a, to a, a different direction that maybe you, you, you wanted or ex expected. Because, you know, the council, just like you, there's, 
you know, there's many of them who, who might have different thoughts about this. So I'm just saying it's your decision, but um, just be cautious of what you ask for. If you want to be open-ended, that's completely up to you. But if you want to be a little more directive and say, this is kind of a marker in the road. We, we, we told you where we are now. We're not through with this, but this is where we are now because we promised we'd give an update. We're going to go back with these things and then expect to hear from us again. Commission? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think we should just send the whole, you know, after hearing the discussion here, send the whole thing to council and ask them, number one, to, com to review it, number two, to comment on it, and three, to provide direction on it. Because this whole thing initiated with them. They asked us months ago to do a history of black and brown people in Palo Alto. We did that. This is what we came up with. Here you go. Now what? Yep. Also, also, we did the original report and then they sent us back with the uh, to do the conversation. So they sent us back twice on this. Mm. Um, I'm 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 torn, right? So I get um, what Minka is saying. Um, you send them a whole ball of stuff and it can go left real quick. You know, you send people stuff and expect a certain response and then you get a totally different response. Um, this is what I believe. Um, there is an issue of belonging in Palo Alto, whether you're black, brown, Asian, older white woman, I don't know actually who feels like they belong. This is recorded, I shouldn't have said that. Um, I, well, I'll say it again. I don't know who actually feels like they really belong at this moment. And I think this is, this is this, although we looked at a specific segment of the population and dealt with racism and equity in this part, I believe there are deeper conversations to be had in our community around belonging whether it's housing, whether it's being Asian, whether it's being Jewish, whether it's being Black, whatever that is for a person. So I think we do send them the whole report, but we have to send them the cover and say, we're finding, how do you best put it? We're finding some trends here. We want to expand this out beyond the original scope, and we want more time to work on it. And these are the areas we want to work on and use what's on page of 15 as Commissioner Crouch recommended. Yes, Commissioner, again. I once again want to reiterate that we have a work plan. And, and, I, is, and I know that belonging is on it. And this is item but, number, this is item number one of the work plan. Right, but I don't think, I think that we should just, so we don't have to reiterate that we're, this is belonging, I think that that it opens up a can of worms when we send this and we're asking them again to comment. I mean, I think commenting, I, I think we should just send it without a cover. I mean, just, they asked for this, just send it. Um, because we have belonging on it and it's, that's our job to figure out how to get people to belong. We can get people to belong, which is on the next item uh, three, which is what Michelle and I were gonna talk about housing, about how to get people to feel belonging. You know, and I, I think, our work plan can get people to feel how to belong. I, and I think that that's what we should, I mean, I, I, just, I, mean, I don't want to waste any more time because I think this I, is- I don't know how we could walk away for, from a report that says that, that the majority of people were white women. And one of the significant findings according to the main researcher was that a lot of them didn't even know what systemic racism was. I don't, you see, that's, I, don't, that's I don't care about a house. I care about my humanity. And if half the people don't understand what systemic racism is, no matter what house you put me in, I still don't belong. I, I understand what you're saying and I totally agree with you. 
and I think we're just going around in circles. I think the f it, it, I, I think we should go with, I, I would make a motion like Daryl, just send it and. Um, if that's the motion. I'll, I'll I mean, I, I, I just think it opens up a can of, I don't think that we should take a small study and have that be our direction for the future. I think we have a work plan and we could use it at the retreat and go from there. Okay. And do more. I will take it. Mary? Now, maybe you can go to screen. Commissioner, Commissioner um, Savage, if you can make your motion. Well, that's actually my motion was Commissioner Savage's motion. Can we get a second on the motion? Um, I'd, I'd like to add, um, you know, the words to review, to comment, and to come back to us and provide direction. All right. Steps. We have, we have we have a we have a motion on the floor. Sorry, what was the last one? Provide what? Direction. Or provide further direction. Shouldn't we ask for further feedback? Further what? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll leave it as is. Um, okay. Um, we have a motion on the floor. Um, I will second the motion. Yeah. Um, we'll start at the top of the alphabet. Can I uh, ask the opening for comments? I think we need to look for more um, discussion, Chair. Yeah, I heard. Um, um, I was about to say Commissioner Snyder. Valerie, can you please comment? Yeah, I have a really picky question. Um, would I still, I saw a couple pages where there were some typos and I'd like to be able to correct those. And in the appendices, the links to the full set of data didn't seem to work. Right. I'd still have the right to. Yes. The, the, as long as it does not, as long as it does not change any of the findings or data, I'm all right with those changes. Great, thanks. All right, um, any other questions? We're open to discussion. Okay, I'll go. I think that there is a big difference between the findings of the report and Chairman Smith, I agree the, city council should get, I mean, they should get all the report, and there, but there's a big difference between the findings and the findings are very important. However, some of the recommendations, I mean, that's where I don't think we can just sign up to follow through on, on all these recommendations based on the sample size and the demographic of the sample. Also, some of these recommendations are I mean, a citizen oversight committee over the police department. That's kind of huge, I think. And the the people that they're seeking input from, I mean, it's not even a complete sample. For example, maybe we need to talk to the public defenders from the city of Palo Alto to see what's actually going on on the streets. Um, and the early education program, mm -hmm. we, need to, we would need to flush that out more. What does that mean? Does this mean implementing just anti-racism or I remember reading, I don't think this was on the slides unless I missed it. Um, that somebody, I don't know if it was a quote, but basically they recommended talking about uh, the creation of East Palo Alto and the history when we, because I know it's in second or third grade, there's a whole unit on the history of the city of Palo Alto Mm -hmm. But nobody talks, you know, the kids, as far as I know, I could be wrong, um, are not being taught about maybe the history of racism in the city of Palo Alto and the creation of East Palo Alto. Now, that's something that um, it's a smaller piece of what they're saying versus just consider an early education program where I don't know where we're going with that. Um, but it's I think that's the small 
but not small piece that we could actually implement and talk to PAUSD about. Does, do I make sense? You mean, I, I, so yeah. this, this, I hear you and I think to go back to what Commissioner Krause had said earlier, where I was going with it earlier, I think there needs to be some, um, there needs to be like a global statement saying this summer findings and we need to do some more work on this and do maybe some feasibility stuff because I agree with you, you know, great suggestion to do all of, redo all of education, but you know, we will sit with, um, Lana and the rest of the team at PAUSD and what they might say, you know, your suggestion might be the suggestion that makes it work. I think, I, I feel like the recommendations are great, but very much like PTC, actually, how do we think of this? <laughs> we dealt with this earlier, PTC, in all their recommendations basically said, ask the council, this is what we have found. Can we go back and, and do more work on this and look at feasibilities and priorities and orders based on the initial research? Because that's what we, that's basically what we did with the rental, the rental stuff. None of it's set in stone, but they still provided all the data and said, we just need you all to say, hey, to go back and start doing the research and figuring out some feasibility on different parts. Commissioner Krause, you raised your hand. No, I, well, I, 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 I come in, do you want to talk to Patty? Yeah, I was going to say that I, I think there's so many little things that, that are on here that are points to be discovered and respond. And, and I think that tonight we have a motion on on the floor and we should be discussing the motion because i think about the education one thing that came out of this is that some teachers are are um were um assigned to look into racism and put it into the the, rec the curriculum and i referred them to um valerie valerie when she was a commissioner i mean people are um are are discussing that and I don't think we should pin I don't think we should go right now into <laughs> the dynamics of each of the um suggestions I'm not, no, no. I'm, I'm, I was going with a global recommendation yeah I mean I, and I and I think even those discussions I mean you're talking about systemic racism this is a long discussion and I think that again I think that we should discuss it at we treat because we and, and and or or when we have like we have we have things that are on the agenda that can include getting people to belong. I mean, that's always part of the thing that I think that our work plan right now addresses all of those issues. So I mean, I don't know one that doesn't. Um, so I, 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 just I will, I will say this. Um, in the last six months in Palo Alto, we had two, two parks sprayed with derogatory language. We had a lawsuit against a Black Lives Matter sign. We had an Asian restaurant um, owner verbally assaulted. And these findings in this are starting to deal and dive with those, with those challenges in our community which is very disturbing to a significant, to, to at least my population. And I think, I think us just saying, oh, we'll get to it. Like it's, 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 it's bad for people. People, people don't feel comfortable. And I think, so, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know at this point. Um, let me just say, I, I totally agree. I'm not saying that I, you know, this horrible stuff was going on and that's why I was upset that we, so that the long, long time during COVID not to meet because there's a lot of issues and people are gonna feel 
you know, the rise of things and, and things are going to happen. And I'm not happy with it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think we're all in the Human Relations Commission, because we want to make our community more inclusive and, and belonging. And I don't, I, don't th I don't think we should be focusing on this report right now. I think we, we read it, we saw it, and it's, you know, we've gotten reports from everybody else. And let's, let's send it to the commission, let's send it to the city council and, and, and go forward. Okay, I'm going. To, so, we just did a year of work that was directed by the council on 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 what Black and Brown experiences and what people experience and how people live in this community. And our response at the finish line is to say, "Just send it to them." I don't know. I don't I'm know. Sorry, I don't. Know. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if we had, we're we're taking the words of 206 people, who 75 percent of them were white women in Northern Pal. I mean, I can't say that that's represent. I, I I just can't. I mean, if I heard from, I mean, I, I'm not saying ignore it. I'm not saying ignore it at all. But we have a lot of people that showed about housing. We've had a lot of people that showed up a lot about a lot of things. I'm not saying ignore it at all. I'm not trying to demise this report by saying let's ignore it. I'm just saying they asked for a report. We did it. Send it. Valerie, you've had your hand up. I do, I'd like to comment on, on two things. One, um, the sample size, um, 206, I don't think there were 206 advocates for um, airplane noise or some of the other issues. That said, if this were a, um, so I think it's, it's not definitive, and, but it is a significant number of people. But um, more important to me is if this were a product development exercise, this was just to identify the questions, not to get to the answers. And so there clearly is more work to be done. Um, the, when we talk about the litany, the lists of examples under community engagement, for example, those aren't meant to be implementation tasks to accomplish a, a goal or a strategy. They were just to illustrate, to give an idea of what some of the people were thinking about and how it would be fleshed out. But those aren't answers. Those are questions. Do we do this or do we do that? Um, they were to stimulate thought. The uh, recommendation is to form a consortium of civic and community organizations to tackle community. Uh, I'm sorry, to convene the stakeholders in the private sector, the nonprofit and the government section to start working on the four areas. I would, I would like to um, we'll do a substitute motion. Um, my substitute motion is that we send the report with the data and limit the recommendation to the recommendations that are on page 15 to be general recommendations. I think I hit a good spot. <laughs> I think I hit a good spot. Um, and I think that will allow us to deliver the report and give us enough room that we can work in the future. Because for as, as long as I'm on this commission, we're going to talk about this because we have populations in our city that is, that no matter how much they make or which tech company or which university they work at, they still feel marginalized and they live in really nice houses. 
Chair, I didn't, I must have, I have repeated words here, so. Send the report with the data and limit the recommendations to those on page 15 of the report on their going yeah. forward. Yeah. I didn't hear the last word. On their going forward. Okay. Can I get a second on the motion? Second. Can I, we have discussion open? All right. Well, let's run. Let's run the ball. All right, Commissioner Everly. Hi. Commissioner Krause. Aye. Commissioner Savage. Aye. Commissioner Regan. Uh, you're muted. Um. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Thank you all. Um. Valerie, please keep your phone on because we're going to call you after we come back from city council. Okay. But um, I would really love um, if Commissioner Krause, um, if you can even connect with Valerie uh, in the in-between time and talk about the data and some points and as we start looking about other steps, because we will we, we would love to have your expertise engaged in that. Thank you. Let us move to our um, second, third item, discussion regarding the potential October event for faith-based community about subsequent opportunities to build and or convert existing and new properties for rental and or purchase of affordable housing in Palo Alto. I will turn this over to Commissioner McGarren and Commissioner Krause. Michelle, do you want to start or since, um, or do you want me to start? It's really your baby, but want me to give a framework? Sure. What would you like? Yeah, okay. whatever you want to say. Why don't you just... I think the, this item really encompasses how we, if we talked about this, let me rephrase this, after we saw the Mountain View facility. Uh, for transitional housing. And we sat with, after that, uh, Evans, and the thought was to reach out and find other opportunities in the faith-based community. Patty has some other suggestions. Uh, because we were listening to what was happening with the RVs and did the RVs need to have background checks or the cars that were allocated to specific uh, properties require a background check and how discriminatory is that? Does it cut people out that really need us? Uh, at a time that they have nowhere else to go. And that was the essence of what we were proposing. Now, it's before Delta occurred and we wanted to have a meeting and bring many of the people together. I asked Patty and others, should we go forward with that when we're just going to be doing another Zoom? at this point. Great. Um, right, and for me, because Michelle um, came, Commissioner Michelle, you know, is new on the commission. So this housing started when I applied for um, HRC and I'd spent a lot of time um, living in this community and talking to many, many people. Um, first, it was Stephen Lee on the commission when I came on board and we were having housing agencies talking to the HRC. Then, you know, then two of, I think we were on the safe parking lot committee um, with faith leaders. Um, so this is 
looking at what the housing element is doing, looking at what the city is doing, and what can our role as a human relations commission, what can we do as, as um, to help and also to um, facilitate something, a positive change. And I think um, not a change, but just, and so we talked with Angie Evans from, from Palo Alto Ford and we talked, I, I talked to um, with Mountain View, I, I went to see Pastor Baines. I, I mean, this came from a lot of discussions with a lot of people and community members. Um, so I think that we, um, we, we, um, transitional housing is one issue, but the real issue is affordable housing. And, and, and I think that's what we are going, we're thinking this, we need to start working on this and, and, and to get, and bring people together. And, and I mean, that's kind of what my thoughts were. So I have, mm -hmm. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, number one, uh, the faith community at this point feels extremely reticent to get in another conversation. They've been for twice in the, the last decade. Um, let me finish. No, no, no. I got to finish. Um, you know, the reality is the hell that PBC went through and what the Unitarian Church is going through and what happened at First Congregation in the early 2010s has, and those are significant churches and significant faith communities. They present an issue. Also, the development of low cost housing. Um, we brought, um, what's the name of the people? The people that, that the homeowners build the houses. Um, Developers? No, no. Um, Habitat for Humanity? Habitat. Habitat for Humanity, yes. Um, it's, I'm tired, it's past my bedtime. Um, <laughs> Habitat for Humanity came and spoke to a lot of churches, including my church. And one of the significant challenge is the value of the land and developing on the land and doing low cost housing without asking the church to give up property at below market rate. And I know housing is very important, but when you start talking about buildings that are 75, uh, communities that are 75 or 100 years old and people's mothers and grandmothers and people sacrifice to build that building and buy that land, it becomes very a very hard discussion as a faith leader to go to people and say, yes, I know that, for example, a two acre plot in Palo Alto was worth $12 million, but we're going to give it away for $2 million so we can build. And I know you've been given tithes and offerings and support in this organization. And it's hard. I think in order to have the conversation, there would have to be some level of business model and figuring out of some of the more difficult questions before you bring it to faith leaders. Because right now, they sat at the table with real good faith with the um, with the safe parking and and, their, and you have faith institutions getting their name dragged through the newspaper no. right now. And so I, I totally agree. I mean, that's what Michelle and I were saying. I mean, we wanted a conversation and this is, this is, this is kind of how I came around to Coloma because I, 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 I too feel that and it, it, that this conversation needs to be brought up. And I think not necessarily the faith leaders and the faith communities have been taking the brunt of it. And, 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 and I, and I, and I, I'm so, so, so I'm glad that you've said that because I felt that. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is on was to have a discussion so we could broaden it because I think we do need to discuss. Um, I, I could send you a ton of articles from the Washington Post, New York Times, to a couple of different papers, because a lot of faith institutions have really looked into leveraging their property 
for, for other uses. The problem is, and I think this is where the research is going to have to come in, is how do you make it? Now, because I don't think churches want to make money. They just want an equitable financial situation. Like the congregation, denomination, governing body, elder board can look with a clear conscience and go, we honored those that bought this property and maintained this property, and we're being helpful to the community. And I think, you know, San Jose has this program now. I don't hear anything else about it from pastors. You're like, the city wants us to give up our property so that we can build housing, you know? Um, they, they, nobody's taking them up on it. No, I know. And I mean, there are some. I mean, I, I, I totally, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, but I mean, as safe parkings, I mean, based, I, I, I think, I mean, now it's late, but Michelle and I were hoping to have a discussion like this because um, originally we were thinking um, people that do do low income housing developers, which do like Eden and stuff, could come to the table and talk with um, faith leaders and other, you know, and community members and how we can get this done in a way that it's not detrimental to the to the neighborhood or detrimental financially to um, places of worship. Because I also heard that some places said if they're going to put four four cars in their parking lots, not enough. Yeah. I mean, I've heard okay. that too. Like, like we're putting a lot of money into something, and it's only and taking a lot of grief and four is not enough. So I think this is more of an open. I know it's as an action item, um, but how do we so, get? Uh, so um, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to um, find my contact at um, Habitat for Humanity. Have you talk with them about the economics of it and figure out what that looks like? And I'll connect you with a couple. I'll connect you with. Um, Pastor Bruce Ray Chow um, at First Presbyterian. He's the convener of one of the faith groups and Rob Schultz, he's a convener of another mm -hmm. group. Um, and let you have the dialogue and discussion with them and see where we end up. Because they probably shouldn't say this. Um, a lot of churches are facing challenges given the financial strain that COVID has done and given the rapid emptying of communities because a lot of, I, I've heard numbers as high as 60% of some um, faith institutions, people have moved out of town once COVID happened. You know, so you have the conversation with the folks and let's see where we come up. But the one thing I will say is, I don't think faith leaders, they want to plan that they could plug into they don't they're not looking to have the dialogue should be about a plan it can't be about the concept well that that's the plan was to have these developers tell that that what they've done and how to do it um but do we have also, we're, also, we're, also, we're not hooked on this Paloma. i mean i don't need to do a little bit more research because i i you know we've we've talked to a lot of people it was more of a suggestion how do we go forward in a way for affordable housing. I, I think, personally, I think the city should take, um, um, we're relying a lot on on places of worship and, 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 um, and I think the city's going towards a little bit more transitional housing time and a lot of money and efforts going into that, which is also important, but uh, we were, we were, trying to figure out how do we get the conversation and thinking process because if we have it on we have to change the zoning laws for something when we have to work on that i mean it's not something that's it's just going to happen in october and you know we could expand it you know we could expand affordable housing and just have a general conversation about affordable housing and how do we go about that i, I you know michelle I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could, because your Mika's really involved in this housing stuff. I mean. So this is the thing. I mean, 
a lot of the information I gave is anecdotal and it's also from two or three years ago. Um, so what I would suggest is this, why don't you put together the meeting, forget who the developer speakers are, I can share the resources I have and let's see where we end up. Is, do you, I don't, Michelle, think we, I don't think we need to do a vote on this because it's, it's a well, meeting. Well, but it, it has to be, it has to be in regards to a vote because we have been meeting with people, but we can't say we're representing HRC in these meetings. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so we do have to have some kind of, um, I mean, I think if you say, and, and, so I mean, so for example, I mean, we, we've been meeting, you know, what I'm saying is that, that, that. So what are we asking the commission to do exactly? We're asking, are you asking the commission to sponsor an event and allow you guys to go recruit speakers? Is that the ask? That was the most, wasn't that most on the agenda? Okay, we could do that because well, that's easy enough. I mean, um, Commissioner Krause, can you present present a motion? Oh, we move to authorize. Yeah, wait, 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 wait for Mary. Okay, don't let me forget it. But can I just, I'm sorry, um, well, my, I just want to say I, I don't want you to think that we're just. I mean, I know it's late now, and we're just supposed. To, you know, I thought we we're going to be, through, but we haven't heard from. I would like to hear before the motion. I mean, I'd like to hear some discussion. Because I'm not dead, I'm not dead set on doing this if everybody thinks, you know what I mean? Like I want it to be successful and I want to go forward in affordable housing, and this is just one step. But if no one feels that it's um do you, do you know what I'm saying? Commissioners. I'm a little well, I guess what I'm hearing from Chairman Smith is that maybe there's no bandwidth within the faith-based community to do this. And I guess what I wanna hear is, have you talked to leaders at these churches and they said, yes, we have an interest in allocating some of our land to build housing that's gonna be either for sale or for rent. Has anybody said that they're willing to do it? Well, we we have talked to some faith-based leaders, but not necessarily on that regard. We, we I talked to them about um, the safe parking lot, and some of them say four is not enough. We want to do, you know, but um, we've talked about zoning with um, Palo Forward. We've talked to Pastor Baines because he's building, um, you know, not that he's building himself, but he has this. Um, it's a seed. It's a seed. You know, when we started the start safe parking lot. I mean, there were some people that were on this committee about fellowship, but we, you know, it's just going and it's, you know, by one fellowship coming, one place of worship stepping up, you know, before safe parking lot, you know, they weren't all talking to all the faith-based organizations to see what the fly was on that one. I mean, safe parking. Mm -hmm. I think is very different than we're talking about a permanent structure. Right. No, it is. It is a um, it's a different discussion. But it's um, and I'm not even saying that this is what I think. I mean, I think personally, I think that um, that um, the city, like Mountain, I mean, Mountain View is stepping up a little bit differently than Palo Alto. Um, but Michelle, do you have anything else to say? I think to frame this for the commissioners and chair, I think that Commissioner Reger has been working on this for a very long period of time. Uh, it is her passion for providing uh, more than transitional housing, but affordable housing. I think she has got resources and thoughts and wanted the support and authorization 
to go forward and have a meeting in October. And this is Commissioner Everly, only the beginning for her. Um, I've come along because I'm, I'm interested, you know, people should, it's a human right to have a place to lay your head that's safe. And I think that's all that Commissioner Regor is looking for. And it's late and we're all bloody tired. Uh, it's a, a commitment of support. Is it of interest? because nobody needs to make work, or is it not? And she'll begin what, what needs to be done to bring a group together in October or November. Hey, Michelle, wh why don't you go ahead and try to craft a, a motion? I'd like to see it in writing, and I think that would help all of us. Um... Okay. Uh move to authorize Commissioner Reger to uh, articulate and develop a plan for a, an affordable housing uh, conversation to begin uh, in the fall timeframe. Well, I don't, I don't. I, I, Does that get there? No, because I, I think that we already, I guess I, I was saying that's good, but because we have been developing, I mean, I, you know, I started working with, with, um, that's a part of our work plan. Okay. And so I think to say that I'm going to be, you know, and, and then I, I guess, are you saying, Michelle, that you're not going to be part of this because- Oh, uh, I'm, I'm undoubtedly can be part of this. I, I but think, well, usually when we have, like we're going to have an event, it's not, it's not that. It's not going to be to research and, and you know, it's more like we're going to have something and, you know, is HRC behind it or not? Is HRC going to sponsor it? Okay. Yeah, we are. So, so, so I so think- But this motion doesn't say that. Well, by us voting on the motion, then that is the body saying we support this. That, that is the strongest statement we as a body can make to author to authorize somebody to use our name to create an event is the strongest spot thing that we yeah. can do. Yes, Minka? Oh, you just, because you were off and then you came back on. No, I was just talking to my child a minute as who came in the room. So that's why. Okay. Um, is there any other discussion on this, on this resolution? Or is there any friendly amendment? I'd, I'd like to change the word authorize to support. Um, I, can't, um, I can't recall HRC ever authorizing a commissioner to do anything, no. um, but you know, we're all here to support. Okay. Um, commissioner Krause, do you accept the framework? I'm fine. And we're well, missing a few other words. What are the words I, that we're missing, Commissioner Krause? Uh, for an affordable housing uh, event. Right. Okay. That was right. Uh, and then to begin uh, um, a race. No, no, backwards. Thank you. All right. But I guess my point, um, Commissioner Krause, is that you I, I don't want to do this by myself. Okay. And it just is me. And because Sunita was on it and, and you know, we've had two. So I, 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 I will support you. So I will be here, but you will be the lead. 
because it's been your path, your your baby to pull forward. Okay. Um, and if that's, Patty, I'm happy to do this with you. Okay, so can you put your name in there too then? Sure. Good, that's all I say. This is like, it just seems. All right. Um, can we, do we have any of the, can we get a second? Commissioner Regeer would be good to second this, please. Okay, I second it. All right, let's let's take a vote. <laughs> from the, I'll start from the bottom of the alphabet. Um, Chair Smith, A I. Commissioner Commissioner Savage. Aye. Commissioner Regeer. Aye. Um, wow. Commissioner Krause. Aye. And Commissioner Everett. Aye. All right. Um, I'm going to make a proposal to the commission that we hold item four and five till our next meeting because we are going into um, almost a fourth or fifth hour. What are we at? Fifth hour? I don't know. It's long. Um, and that we hope, I, I know um, the folks that liaison with PAPD wanted to do some stuff at the commissioner report level, um, but I'm asking to hold that till next time um, and add those items to our next meeting. If there are no objections to that, that we, we can do that, um, but it's up to you guys. All right, I hear no objections. All right. Um, um, I, I can call the meeting at this point. Everybody ready to go to bed, go home? Um, I want to thank you. Great work tonight. A lot of hard conversations. A lot. This is what we do. This is what we're supposed to do. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to uh, us wrapping up um, the Retro's Protection next time. I'm also looking for us to really dive into his rap next time. And we will, after that time, look at our work plan. Um, I will also officially add the PAPD report as a item, not just as a commissioner report. And we'll go from there. All right. Everybody, thank you for your um, willingness and your diligence. We will talk to everybody later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.